just one night of poor sleep will raise inflammation. We do need inflammation in small amounts to signal to our body about uh, stresses or to fight pathogenic bacterial microbes. So inflammation is the commonality between just about every health problem we face as a society. How is it that food? Just do us a little short recap. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between food and inflammation? Every food we eat is feeding inflammation or fighting it. There's no benign food. There's no Switzerland meal that's like just neutral and it's doing nothing. It's doing something to your biochemistry. Now, of course, there's a spectrum as far as that's concerned. There's ones that are going to be mild modulators and be some be major modulators of our biochemistry and instructing inflammatory cascades. But largely the standard American diet is there's a, a great disparity between that and our genetics. So research estimates that our genome, our DNA hasn't changed in 10,000 years, but yet look at our food supply. It's changed very dramatically in a very short period of time when you're looking at the total existence of the human race. So that's the problem because these gene predispositions have been around for 10,000 years. But why are they being awoken like never before in just the last couple decades? And in our lifetime, even, you can see the numbers rise. Why is that? Well, in part, it's our food supply and what we've done to it. And we've seen over the last 100 years a vast rise of chronic health problems because of the, the, the impact that we have, uh, the, the, the uh, turmoil and the trauma that we put on the earth, the, the, the mineral depletion of the soil, the amount of hybridization and genetic modification and the glyphosate spraying and just food being really not even food anymore for a vast amount of people. Uh, that's a problem, but it's not just food, obviously. It's yeah, a, your book focuses a lot on food because that's a place where a lot of people can start. It's something yeah. that we do you know, one to three times a day, depending on who the person is. Mm -hmm. But big picture, give us a couple other areas. Just touch on them of how those areas are linked to the inflammation spectrum. Yeah, and I, and I wanted the book to talk about these non-food things because i see that so many times people that got all the food things down right they're eating decently but these non-food inflamers can really keep them back so we have to look at stress and really look at stress and i mean chronic stress the human race is here because we could handle a certain level of stress and and, and you look at the totality of human existence we actually went through a lot more stressful times we live in, in many ways for a lot of the human race they live quite better than most humans lived but we're talking about this insidious uh chronic stress that's we are not adapted to genetically and that is like we're being chased by a tiger, but there's no tiger and it never goes away. So then we have to look at technology. We have to look at environmental toxins and the stress that's having on our DNA and looking at those as separate problems too. looking at technology and the impact that's that's having to us, looking at things like social isolation, looking at sleep. Sleep is a problem or I should say sleep is not the problem. The lack of sleep is the problem that's going on today because people are so stressed out and they aren't uh, giving the giving quality restorative sleep the, the respect it deserves. This is not a luxury. This is not, I'm going to sleep when I'm dead, which people say that in jest. This is a mandate on your health. And it, just one night of poor sleep just one night will raise high sensitivity C-reactive protein or raise inflammation. But yet, how many people do we know? It's not a one night problem. This is a continual, I just don't get enough sleep. Right. And the body's very resilient. It can make up for, you know, a little bit here and there. But yeah. as you're saying, when it's chronic, when it becomes part of our lifestyle, mm -hmm. when we're drinking caffeine afternoon, when we're regularly going to sleep at odd hours, we don't have yeah. the best quality. We're using our phone all the way. You add those years, you add those days up, they turn into years. Yeah. And now all of a sudden this becomes the foundation of your, of your life. Yes. We have to look at food. We have to look at stress. We have to look at toxins. We have to look at sleep. We have to look at social connection because while we're so connected right now on social media, it's not actually the same as real social connection. So people are connected because they're scrolling through their phone. They think they're connected, but people are so isolated and the impact that's having on our biochemistry because humans... Uh, it's just it's been shown in many many studies that social connection improves health and lowers inflammation levels 
and then looking at the blue light aspect of of technology and smartphones and the different uh, waves that people are being exposed to. We don't know the long-term effects of this, but I think in the short term, you can see anecdotally that we are having a problem, a uh, real problem. And there's, the, again, this growing mismatch between genetics and epigenetics that's at the heart of it. So we got something fun coming up. We have a, you've brought a, a case study of one of your patients that you've worked with to set it up. So we talked about this area called subclinical right? Finding the problem before it becomes a problem or looking deeper if somebody has a diagnosis into what are some of the root factors that are there. Big picture, we've talked about this podcast before. Many guests have shared that in traditional allopathic medicine, Western medicine, the body is really seen as a, a group of silos. Each organ is a silo. Each system is a silo. And mm -hmm. it's only recently we're starting to peel back and start to understand that all these things are not individualized. They're connected. Yeah. Your gut has to do with your heart health. Your heart health has to do, you know, your, your teeth relate to your heart. Your brain relates to your gut. Your gut relates to your brain. It's all connected. Yeah. And as a functional medicine practitioner, part of your role with patients individually, and you still do see patients, some patients yeah. individually, is using advanced laboratory testing to help people see the connections that typically might not show up on their normal reports they get back from the doctor uh, along with like a deep case review. So you've brought, um, and with the ultimate goal of getting to the root of where this inflammation is coming from, yeah. how big of a problem it is, and the, of course, bringing the patient back to health. Yeah. So set us up, give us a little bit of a background uh, of what this patient was dealing with when they came into your office. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my, just to get, piggyback off what you said, my day job is not writing books. It, it is seeing patients and it's my passion, my heart. I consult people around the world via webcam. And it not only is my honor to be a part of people's health journey, it, it keeps me sharp too on a clinical level. Cause I can really be on top of the research in a way that, that, Practice just gives us doctors like that sharpness, like nothing else. Um, so, with this, with that said, this is um, all HIPAA compliant. The name is removed. Let's say that. And then, the, what she was going through was what a lot of my patients were going through. They're immersed in the health space because they've had to be. They had they had to be their own health advocate because doctors are saying there's nothing wrong. It looks like autoimmune. You're struggling with debilitating fatigue, you have depression and anxiety, you have brain fog, you have these other inflammatory symptoms, you have digestive problems. She's eating all the good things, doing all the things she's learned, but she's still struggling. She's better than what she was, meaning she got herself to a certain level of, I'm better. Uh, so she's definitely improved compared to when she first had her flares, but she isn't where she want, wants to be, and she knows there's things keeping her back. Uh, and that's typically the cases that I'm used to seeing. So what she has on the lab here, uh, first things on the, I put, what we do is we put all the blood labs on a spreadsheet. Um, and, and this is labs. And just for context, you did a whole sort of intake with her as well. Yeah. So it started you know, with a health history. Health history, literally starting from like, yeah. You know, tell us how you were you know, born via like C-section or not, totally. or this, were you on antibiotics? Because labs are only a snapshot in time mm -hmm. and they can only teach you so much, but the right labs along with the right story, uh, a great practitioner like yourself and other mm -hmm. functional medicine doctors that are out there can start to paint patterns and pictures together. Totally, So, and the health history is Another thing that we don't value enough because it can tell you so much clinical pearls that it even informs me on what labs are the most relevant because that's maybe a um, critique that functional medicine gets is, oh, you guys run so many labs. Well, if you're taking a proper health history, you really aren't. You're being comprehensive without being excessive. And I'm really only running labs where we have action steps for, where I, I want to see what's going on so we can have appropriate action steps. So we're not just running you know, superfluous labs for the sake of it or being excessive for the sake of it. And that's really where a health history is so paramount to lean into what labs are the most pertinent. Yeah, and that typically takes you like an hour to do along with the forms least, of the patients yeah. filling in. Compare that to most people, you show up to the doctor's office, you're getting like 10 minutes. Totally. And they're looking at your forms right like five minutes beforehand or yeah. during the actual yeah. appointment, which is which was always frustrating to me when I was a kid. I was yeah. like, this guy's my doctor. Yeah. Actually, we had a really great family doctor, but a few times I was referred to different specialists yeah. for dealing with 
things. Anyways, let's jump into it. Totally. And this is the duality of functional medicine. There's the science and there's the art. And the art is the health history. The art is talking, connecting with the person. The art is like the space in between the words of just what's that person going through. So then we get into the labs after that. And then what we see here is that she had high ferritin levels. So ferritin is a biomarker to gauge for stored iron, uh, but it's also considered an acute phase reactant. So basically in states of inflammation, you can see ferritin spiking, and this was spiked for her because in the present, there, there was normal iron, there's normal iron saturation, all the other iron markers were normal except her ferritin. So in the context with the health history, going back to that, it makes sense. You could see these inflammatory markers being spiked. And a lot of these labs actually I put in a sidebar in the book so people can kind of see what the optimal range is because that's why I have the spreadsheet because it's looking at IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine's optimal ranges. Which is the nonprofit training organization that trains all these functional doctors like yourself. Exactly. So I'm not looking at the lab's reference range. I am because I want to put it in context, but I am not looking at it to give a functional medicine perspective. So I'm looking at both, looking at the conventional side, looking at the functional medicine side, so I can explain and educate the patient and empower them on what's going on with their body. Um, and the next thing I see going on is she had slightly functionally low white blood cells. So what that means is that she had a sort of a chronic immune stressor. It's nonspecific. It's not saying what's going on here, but that's why we run more labs to kind of give context to that. So this is looking at the what more or less here as far as the immune system, um, but it's not looking at the why but we will get into that. And for the for the white blood cells, were they out of the normal range? That was that there was, was the tail end of the low end of normal on a lab conventional reference range. So she could still, you know, maybe a conventional doctor who didn't know her full history, everything like that, didn't have the time because of the pressures of seeing patients yeah. might say like, okay, this is a little abnormal, but fine, whatever. It's not crazy. Totally. But you're using this as one of the pieces of information to put this story together and saying there's soldiers on the street at an elevated level that you haven't had before. Mm -hmm. Something is going on outside. Right. And at one point it would have been high and then now it's at this lower chronic level. But here's the bigger point here. I see lab low white blood cells for on patients and they knew about it. They they say, oh, that's normal for me. And it has been going on for years. And this is, that's just one example right. where at the lab actually oftentimes will call these things out, but there's no discussion around it. Mm. It's just like, well, yeah, well, there's, if there's not a clear medication for it, it's like, I'll oh, see you later. There's nothing you see that, it. we don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. But we can give the context to it. Uh, she also had low T3 levels, which your thyroid hormone is predominantly produced in the form of T4, a tyrosine protein and four iodine molecules. It's converted in the liver. 80% of T4 is converted to T3 in the liver. 20% of the conversion of T4 to T3 happens in the gut microbiome with the healthy balanced microbiota of the microbiome. Uh, so she had what we would call in functional medicine low T3 syndrome, where her body was not activating that thyroid hormone. So she had the, the lower levels of our body's gasoline. Every cell of our body has a thyroid receptor site. So she was sluggish, but believe me, her fatigue, which she was dealing with debilitating fatigue, this is not the totality of her fatigue, but it was a component. And that's another point to bring up here is that people want the magic bullet and think, what's the one thing? Yeah. Why am I tired? Well, sometimes there's magic bullets, but oftentimes it's a confluence, a perfect storm of a lot of different things that will give rise to why somebody feels the way that they Especially do. Especially if it was that she can remember back to, you know, whatever age this individual is, but just putting out an example, if somebody was in their twenties and had really good energy and then now they're in their mid 40s or late 50s and if it went slowly down over a period of time that's a mm -hmm. good example that it's a bunch of things exactly you know it was not one thing yeah, that led compounded. to that so it's a bunch of things that are there maybe it's the thyroid is 15 percent of it maybe it's you know something else is related to it maybe it's food sensitivities that all these things add up to the reason why somebody might be dealing with exactly fatigue. and this is the inflammation spectrum these compounded issues that are driving dysfunction in the body um and then she had some nutrient deficiencies uh, that we want to work on because some of them have to do with the thyroid conversion itself, like selenium is used to make the enzyme 5 prime deiodinase, which you need to convert T4 to T3. She had a selenium deficiency. Um, she had a bit of iodine deficiency as well. She had vitamin D, magnesium, 
uh, deficiencies. And, and magnesium, for example, we've had Sean Stevenson on the podcast and Dr. Hyman talks about this a lot himself. Magnesium is not just like a random mineral. <laughs> it's used in over 400 different yeah. mechanisms inside the body. Four different, 400 different actions in the body need magnesium to happen. So when you're low, that's 400 things that can happen exactly the way that they're needed to. Yeah, it's nature's chill pill. It's nature's Xanax <laughs> and, and many other wa wa ways and many other important pathways as well. But many people, she had depression and anxiety. I mean, this was a component to why she was feeling the way that she was. Again, way more complex than just magnesium deficiency, but it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I didn't want to skip over this, but I did, so I'll go back to it. She had high reverse T3, which it's basically a certain percentage of our thyroid hormone is converted into something called reverse T3 or RT3, you'll see on the lab sometimes. It's an unusable form of the thyroid hormone. It's like the, the brakes on the checks and balances of our thyroid hormone conversion. You need the brakes. We need a certain level of brakes for balance in the body, the Goldilocks principle. But sh she had a lack of balance there. She had too much brakes because basically what will happen is the reverse T3 will bind to the thyroid re receptor site, but be unusable. So you'll elicit a lot of that those li low thyroid symptoms because your body's making too much reverse T3. What can cause that? Stress, chronic infections, inflammation, cortisol disruptions can all contribute to high reverse T3. Um, and then sort of the, what I would consider from a health history standpoint and a workup standpoint, I would consider the upstream components to her problem, this specific person's problem, to be chronic infections. Meaning I think a lot of what was going on, <clears throat> and we didn't go over her gut yet, there was things going on in her gut and a lot of gut-centric inflammation as we see that, but she also had a mold exposure and she had uh, uh, Lyme co-infections. So it was really a trifecta of those upstream chronic infections that were driving the inflammation that was impacting her gut brain axis, impacting her brain hormonal axis, her hormones were all, all out of balance as well. So this is um, the things we found out through her labs. And all those things, all those pieces of the puzzle, they all are impacting and placing her on the inflammation spectrum at different degrees. And the totality of it is that I feel like I'm doing things right, but I'm still not getting better. Yeah, exactly. So high level, and, and just zoom out, if you can remember, I know we have a lot of the labs printed out, but yeah. just big picture, <clears throat> what, what were some of the labs that you had done, just high level? So you looked at her gut microbiome. These are yeah. all tests that have to be ordered through a doctor mm -hmm. and a good functional medicine doctor or individual out there that has access to these emerging labs. And again, some of them are conventional, can run yeah. for you, but just big picture, you looked at her gut microbiome. Yeah, so we did a full microbiome panel. We did a two or three day collection of her gut microbiome. It's a stool test. It looks at the, basically the landscape of the microbiome. So it looks at good bacteria, any bacter bacterial imbalances or dysbioses, looks at yeast and fungal overgrowth. And it's a DNA test to see what types of yeast and fungal overgrowths are there. We look at digestion and absorption. We look at inflammation in the gut. We're running inflammatory proteins in the gut like calprotectin and lysozyme that are basically immune markers that when they're high, it's, it's, it's indicative of a state of inflammation as far as the gut is concerned. And remember, like Hippocrates said, the father of medicine, all disease begins in the gut. Well, to understand inflammation, inflammation is a product of the immune system. We have to look at where the predominance of the immune system resides. It's in the gastrointestinal system. So looking at the gut is not only pertinent from a digestive standpoint, but it's also pertinent from a brain health standpoint. It's also pertinent from an immunological standpoint and an autoimmune standpoint. So it has far reaching implications. And so break down the gut and then the immune system in the gut Listeners of this podcast have heard this before. Yeah. Just in case somebody's new and they need a little bit of a recap. I always love recaps. It's the yeah. way to learn is you remember. Right. Remembering is learning. Yeah. Uh, so tell us more. Why is our vast majority of our immune cells in the gut and our immune system is considered to be in the gut? Mm -hmm. And how is that affected? Yeah. So first of all, I find fascinating because this is the Broken Brain podcast, your gut and brain are formed from the same fetal tissue. Uh, meaning the baby is, when babies are growing in their mom's womb, they're growing from the same tissue, the gut and brain, and they're inextricably linked for the rest of our lives to the gut brain axis. And if you think about it, the intestines uh, even look like the brain. 
Uh, and 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut and stored in your gut. Most of your followers know this, but many people still don't. So many mental health issues begin in the gut or at least have gut components and should be looked at for many people, not everybody. Um, but it wields a lot of influence. And when you look at the enteric nervous system and the amount of the microbiota in the gut, there's over different studies will say different numbers, but about 100 trillion bacteria in our, in our gut. We have about 10 trillion human cells. So if you go off of that number, you're about 10 times more bacteria than human. A sort of like a sophisticated host for this microbiome metropolis. And they wield a lot of influence on our immune system. So zooming out big picture, I'm sure this patient was a while ago, but can you remember at least high level what some of the solutions were that you brought in to mm -hmm. help her address these issues, these chronic effect infections, mold? And we've had people like Dave Asri and we've had um, Dr. Ann Shippey, who's considered one of the top functional medicine mold experts from Austin, Texas on the podcast. And they've talked about just how much havoc mold can wreak on the body, mm -hmm. body how it can make it look like Lyme disease is sort of expressing yeah. itself. It's like so complicated. Some of it's above my head. Uh, but what were some of the things that you did for yeah. this patient? Yeah, and that is a, a good point to bring up is she had some of the things we looked at was not just the epigenetic stuff, not just the gut and the brain and the hormones and all the different th things we just talked about, but it's also looking at the genetic component to it. This lady had methylation genetic SNP, like the MTHFR gene variant. Basically, her body was slower at methylating, which you need to detox and for healthy hormones and gut and brain function. Uh, she had a, a double SNP of the MTHFR C677T allele, which is a more problematic. It inhibits the conversion of, of folic acid into folate by like 70%, some, somewhere around that. So her body, she had high homocysteine levels, another form of inflammation that I talk about in the book. She had it. Um, and she also had these gene variants to the different cannabinoid gene variants, which the endocannabinoid system, people are hearing a lot about CBD oil and how that works. Well. It works on the endocannabinoid system, the ECS. And she had these gene variants that uh, predisposed her in part to being higher, a, highly, a higher likelihood of having these food reactivities to things like lectins and alkaloids and just food sensitivities at large. Um, because what research is showing is that the gut is rich with these CB1 receptors, these endocannabinoid uh, receptors that make, and this is associated with higher inflammation levels. So a lot of people on this inflammation spectrum, specifically the autoimmune inflammation spectrum, are have a highly higher likelihood of having these different methylation gene SNPs, these detox gene variants, these slower detox genes, and slower cannabinoid gene variants. So with that said, we looked at that, that as well. Which yeah, is, and you're not using 23 and Me to look at that. You're looking at like a doctor level, yeah. you know, genetics test. And we can use the raw gene data from 23 and Me and things like that. Right, but you can export it and put it into certain yeah, software. They're, they're not giving that to the layperson. Right. Um, and so what we did is I went upstream to deal with the chronic infections first. We put her on different uh, herbal antimicrobial protocols that took months. It was not a quick fix, but this lady is living her life down. She's feeling fantastic. She's 70 to 80% better. She's actually still in care. This isn't that old of a case. Um, and she's, she's so much better than she was, but it was still not a quick fix because dealing anybody dealing with mold toxicity and chronic Lyme infections and co-infections will tell you this is not a quick fix, even with the best doctor out there. But with that said, we're, we hit the ground running with dealing with these problems, different antimicrobial protocols for the chronic infections, different detox protocols for the mold problem, removing the source as well, because she had mold not only in her house, but in her car. Like she was, there was some sort of drainage problem in her car and she was breathing it in every day. Again, she had these detox gene variants that her body wasn't a good detoxer, not a good methylator. Her endocannabinoid system wasn't the strongest. So that that's a lot of the governing system of regulating inflammation and clearing out pathogens and toxins. So some people could tolerate some of these stressors. She couldn't. A lot of my patients can't. That's like a, a glass size. They have smaller glasses, so to speak. Yeah, this is why personalized medicine is so important. Some people can handle certain things, yeah. other people can't. Totally. So we can't change our glass size. We can't change our genetic tolerance to stressors, but we can change what we put in the glass. So we started to empty the glass, proverbially speaking. 
And I just want to say that you're not just making this up. You're following sort of a systems-based approach outlined by the Institute of Functional <laughs> Medicine, along with your own yeah. experience. No, I'm not making it all. When, when I say up. you're not making the solution up in terms of no. how to approach her, I'm not. There's a reason it. you started with chronic infections first and yeah. then moved to the next thing and the next thing. Yeah, because that's the methodology that's taught in the in IFM the Institute totally. of Functional Medicine. And every doctor has their little art Tweak to it. it right? Yeah, they have their art and dance to it. But you're right. We have to go upstream and I think most of my colleagues would agree with me. You have to start with those things. Yeah. But then I had this really big aha moment. Like what if I take this uh, list of things I'm taking in supplement form and I figure out where they're at in the food supply? and I restructure my paleo diet to stress those particular nutrients. That food's probably a lot more complicated than supplements. That if I reorganize my diet, maybe I'd get some, some other things that'd be good for me. So I uh, go ask my uh, dietitian friends, uh, I, I take in my list of nutrients, and they throw up their hands and say like, you know, we, I, we need a, a dietetic intern to help you, I, 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 I don't know. So then I go over to the, pub, the um, uh, health sciences library and talk to librarians, and they aren't really that helpful either. I, and then I go back to Google, and I discover the Linus Pauling uh, Institute on Micronutrients, and that's a gold mine. So now I have the food sources for all these key nutrients. And I have these list of foods I'm going to start emphasizing in my diet. Now, mind you've already been meticulously gluten-free, dairy-free because I'm doing the AIP protocol uh, per um, uh, Dr. Cordain. But now, rather than just focusing on what to not eat, now I'm focusing on what I have to eat. Uh, and in that period of time that you were going dairy-free and gluten-free, just like with the original supplements, I know there's a lot of different things that are going on. Did you notice that that improved things not at all. Slightly. Not at all. Not, Not at all. all. And, and so you might ask, so why did I stay with it? I figured like, well, you know, my brain, was, I, I clearly had been ill for quite a while. I clearly had a very aggressive disease. I did not know how long it would take um, for, for things to repair. And at least I was doing something. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I wanted to be doing something. And so I'd stayed with it. I added supplements. And I wasn't getting stronger with my supplements, but I did figure out I was uh, better with them than without them, and it was slowing my decline. Right. And so March, uh, pardon me, December 26th, I started this new way of eating. We had salmon, we had a big kale salad, uh, we had a lot of garlic in it, we had some ginger in it, uh, we had um, berries, although I don't quite remember which berries it, that was. Um, and then we uh, made some other vegetables, uh, probably cauliflower. All reverse engineered from you looking at that database, that database of micronutrients. What were some of the examples of like some of the key things? I mean, you just mentioned some, but what were some examples to compare and contrast that were not really in your diet, even though you were gluten-free? So I, I wasn't eating liver. You know, so I was back, by God, I was gonna have liver once or twice a week. Um, I was make, also wanna be sure I was having heart. Um, I uh, was much more meticulous about having only uh, organic food, only uh, wild caught um, uh, or uh, wild caught fish or uh, grass fed, grass finished meat. Uh, and uh, if it was not uh, organic, uh, I was not going to eat it. So in a way to, to zoom out a little bit big picture, because diet is so central as part of your protocol, even though you were doing paleo before, it was primarily what meats to not eat. from what to not eat, and also meats from sort of muscle proteins instead yeah, it was, of it looking was muscle at protein. Uh, it wasn't organ meats. It wasn't organ meats. Uh, it wasn't bone broth. Um, you know, it, and in uh, retrospect, when uh, when I look back at my youth, I'd had uh, a lot of tonsillitis uh, age three, tonsils out age four, uh, probably had a lot of antibiotics. Uh, yeast overgrowth and dysbiosis, uh, leaky gut, uh, severe gluten sensitivity, uh, and that although 
I'd been gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, I probably had not healed my leaky gut. Right. So a lot of different foods would trigger that. Correct. So when um, I uh, added the organ meat uh, and the bone broth, uh, likely I healed that leaky gut. Now, the other, the other thing, uh, some other really interesting observations. Uh, when I started uh, adding all this kale and uh, cooked greens, I discovered I had this uh, incredible craving of cooked greens uh, and greens. So when people uh, get shocked, they talk like nine cups of vegetables. Like, Terry, how, how can you possibly do nine cups Which of vegetables? Which is the recommendation inside of your protocol. We haven't gotten into it yet, but it's like, it's a big emphasis on like nine cups of vegetables yeah. every day. Yeah, you know, it's a way of thinking uh, of about merging the best parts of the Mediterranean diet and the paleo diet. So yeah. you end, end up with something that, something that looks uh, a bit like the uh, Walls diet. Um, but the nine cups is actually much less than what I was doing. I was probably having nine cups of greens plus uh, the additional vegetables. Um, and when I became well enough that I was traveling, uh, Drew, and I couldn't get that huge volume of vegetables, within 24 hours, my energy would start tanking. My mental clarity would start tank tanking. Now, the the science has sort of caught up, or, I, or I've discovered the science more, that, um, Vitamin K uh, turns out to have a huge role in myelin, in myelin repair, in brain stem cells. And for those listeners on the podcast that aren't familiar with the role that myelin plays in the body, what can you explain that? Oh, sure. So um, the myelin is the fat wrapper around the wiring between brain cells. So if you have a nice uh, thick coating of myelin, the transmission is fast uh, and efficient. When the myelin breaks down um, and it can't be repaired well, then the transmission is slow and spotty. You're more likely to have uh, weakness, more likely to have sensory disturbance. So it, now in retrospect, I would say that my intense craving for greens, once I began eating them and realized like I could not get enough, um, was probably uh, reflecting that when I had all those greens, the bacteria in my um, small intestine could help metabolize that into uh, K2, which would then be absorbed in my ileum, which would then go to my liver to be metabolized to K2, MK4, which could then go up to my brain and uh, help support the oligodendrocyte precursor cells that help uh, make the uh, myelin. So sort of a long sequence there. Uh, so it was just uh, phenomenal, uh, the benefits of having all those greens. So you discovered the Institute of Functional Medicine. You're going even further. There's this emphasis on additional things of focusing what to eat, not just what not to eat. Mm -hmm. And if I could zoom out for a second, were you also getting a better understanding of what potentially were some of the factors that led to the buildup of having an autoimmune disease? Sure. Um, so a as I went through the neuroprotection course, that was really focused on mitochondria and the brain. Uh, and then uh, it wasn't actually until I recovered quite remarkably, and I'm going through more uh, IFM courses, that I'm really and, deeping my uh, understanding of the autoimmune process. And for anybody that's not familiar, we've mentioned it many times before, but the I IFM is the Institute of Functional Medicine. They're a nonprofit that educates practitioners all around the world. Many mm -hmm. of them are physicians or practitioners like yourself who have gotten sick at some point in time, like Dr. Hyman and many others. That's how nearly all of us get, get to uh, the Institute. There's this new generation of people who are coming in, like my brother-in-law, who's a cardiologist in, in uh, San Diego, who are not sick because now there's so many authors like yourself who are teaching them. It's like young med students and individuals who are getting into it. But the first wave was literally doctors who were looking for an answer, could not find the answer or found a piece of the answer, got referred to IFM, and then began their additional training into the root factors that actually cause mm -hmm. health and cause yeah. disease. Correct, correct. Almost like a med school, you know, like a second you know, phase of it. So my my undergraduate degree is a Bachelor of Fine Arts in studio art painting. Um, and so I decided I was gonna starve as an artist and I went back, picked up my science and applied to medical school, got in. Basic science was really hard, or way harder for me than many of my colleagues. 
I was so thrilled to be done with uh, biochemistry and physiology, and so thrilled to discover it again uh, when I became ill and realized that that was going to be the key to my recovery. And so uh, it, it, it gives me a lot of smiles now uh, and laughter to realize uh, I just love reading about biochemistry and physiology now in uh, immunology, neuroimmunology, because uh, those certainly were the keys to my recovery. So, you know, we're following this story and just like everybody's listening so intently, let's continue on on the story. Okay, so December 26th, I start this new way of eating. You know, and January begins, I'm gonna go off to this uh, new clinic that I have to be in, the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic. And I'm, you know, assuming I can't do that job. It's gonna be more physically demanding than what I can do. Uh, the first week, you know, it's the middle of January, now I, I'm there and I'm, I've just been watching my partners do these exams. Third week of January, Okay, Terry, time for you to do the exams. So I'm uh, into three weeks of eating this way. I'm about ready to start my fourth week. I start seeing the patients. And you know, at the end of the first day, I'm like, well, that wasn't too bad. At the end of the week, I'm like, I, th I can do this. And I realize something's happening. And uh, so it's with breathtaking speed, I'm beginning to realize, you know, my, my, I, my thinking's more clear. And then I realize, you know, my energy's better. And then I realize I don't have to sit in the zero gravity chair at home to have supper. I, I can sit in my other desk chair. I can, I can, I can sit upright. And then, um, I think it's about three months, I have a, a piece of mail that I should uh, take down to the mailbox. Uh, it's probably about a, oh, the equivalent of, a, of about uh, half a block. I, mean, I haven't done this for years at the VA. I pick up my uh, walking sticks I put the letter in my pocket and I walk to the mailbox and I mail that letter. My colleagues see me in the hallway go like, oh my God, Dr. Walls, you're walking. <laughs> um, and then I start walking. I leave my uh, wheelchair in the corner. I, um, I have a scooter. Uh, I take my wheelchair home, park that. Uh, and then in the garage, I have my uh, uh, a scooter. I leave that in my office, but I'm not really using that. Uh, six months into all this. No, it's not quite six months, maybe uh, four months, five months into this. Um, my every two year follow up with uh, my chair of internal medicine is due. And now that's a, a little bigger walk than just around the hospital. It's down a hill, up a hill. You know, it's maybe like half mile. That's clearly too far. So I get in my scooter. I'm driving my scooter over, and I'm going up the hill, and you hear this motor go, rrr, rrr, rrr. Oh, shit. So I get out, and I say, okay, what if I just walk next to it? So I get a few more feet, and that stops again. Then I uh, disengage the drive shaft, and I push it up the hill. And then I you know, get to the door, and the, um, uh, attended offers to call me the, the patient mobile. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm already late to see the chair of medicine. I can't, how long, how, how long am I gonna have to wait? So, oh, it's about half an hour. Like, oh, I can't do that. So just watch my scooter. And I finish the way walking, getting to my chairman's office. The secretary is quite perturbed because now I am late. Uh, and uh, they usher me into the chairman's office and I apologize, tell him that my scooter died on the way over. He goes, oh, you had to wait for the patient mobile? So no, no, I, I pushed it up the hill and I walked over. Now he hadn't seen me in about nine months. The last time he had seen you, you were in a wheelchair. I was in a wheelchair and I looked really bad. Um, so I, I um, explained to him, he said, oh, so you must be taking Tizabri. I said, well, no, actually I'm not. I actually, I'm off all my disease modifying drugs with my neurologist approval. 
I'm just using diet and lifestyle. Uh, and so I showed him my e-stem device, uh, told him my story, talked about what I was doing. He, he's a rheumatologist, by the way. He says, Terry, this is so important. Your job for this year is to get a case report written up. Mm. I said, on myself? I said, yes. Uh, work with your treating physician, your treating medical team. You get this written up. This is so important. People do not recover from progressive MS. Mm. So uh, I did that. Uh, and then um, he would call me back uh, uh, when I had that done. I thought I was done. He goes, no, no now we're going to have you do a safety and feasibility study. So he would head, head me down that path. Uh, and then uh, a couple months later on, on Mother's Day, I um, we had a, a family meeting because I, I wanted to ride my bike. It was the first time in six years. Uh, and fortunately for me, the family, uh, Jackie said that we, we, I could. Um, I could try anyway. Uh, she'd have my son jog on the left. My daughter would jog on the right. She would follow up on the bike. And I was able to bike. And of course, that felt like um, a really quite miraculous uh, because that was something I completely accepted uh, would never happen again. And uh, so uh, when, when that happened, um, certainly how I understood disease and health was very different. Uh, the way I practiced medicine would be different. Uh, and actually, it was shortly after that that my chairman called me back and said, um, I want you to do a safety and feasibility trial. We're going to have you change the research that you do. Incredible. And I'm sure even for, in addition to the magnitude for yourself, just the magnitude for your family witnessing all this, for your partner, oh, we're for all your crying. kids. <laughs> we're all crying. We're all crying a lot. Yeah. And the joy of that, because anybody who knows somebody with uh, how would you rank, I mean, how would you rank the severity of MS and progressive MS compared to like other autoimmune uh, diseases in terms of how much it affects the mobility of the body, body and how quickly sort of the decline is? Well, <clears throat> typically, um, you know, everyone is unique and it depends on what part of your body uh, is impacted. I got into really quite profound disability very quickly. It, is that typical, no, atypical? No, no, no. Well, I, was, I had much, much more aggressive. Yeah. Uh, for the newly diagnosed person, within 10 years, one third will have some kind of gait impairment, needing a cane, walker, or wheelchair. So within three years, I needed a wheelchair. Within seven years, I could not sit up like you are in, in this chair. I was not able to sit uh, up in a regular chair. I had to have a zero gravity chair or be in bed. And by the zero gravity chair, I mean uh, one that lets me lie back so my knees are higher than my nose. Um, and I was beginning to have uh, brain fog. There's a lot more recognition that um, impaired thinking uh, begins to accrue. Uh, anxiety and depression can begin to uh, accrue. Now, uh, there were some, a lot of fortunate things. My hands were still working well. And even though I've had uh, optic neuritis, and there's uh, clearly evidence of optic neuritis in both eyes, uh, my vision is still uh, really quite good. But. So I want to zoom out because people have heard the term MS. And we'll come back to your story. But I want to do a little bit of a, what, when you were a med student, and you were learning about autoimmune conditions and diseases like MS, what were you taught about the fundamental reason that they happen inside the body? <laughs> and then yeah. as that journey continued and your research continued and you connected with IFM, how did that understanding grow further from there? So the conventional... Uh -uh. Uh, way that people are taught about autoimmune issues is that your immune cells begin attacking uh, otherwise healthy tissues. We don't know why. Uh, there appears to be some genetic risk factor, maybe an infection of some type, maybe, and a host of other unknown environmental factors. Uh, because in twin studies, 
you are at slightly increased risk if you're a twin or a sibling uh, has an autoimmune condition, but you don't necessarily have it, even if you have two parents or an identical twin with an autoimmune condition. There's still a greater probability that you will not have it. So these other factors, but no one talked about you know, diet, quality, stress, or sleep, or exercise. They just said, take the disease-modifying drugs. Uh, There's no cure. No cure. It's really just focused on treatment, and the primary intervention for treatment is maybe some... Drugs. Phys- primary drugs, maybe some physical therapy, depending on what people you know, are that, at. You know, and ironically enough, I had to refer myself to physical therapy uh, because I was like, I mean, I'm a former athlete, so I knew exercise would be really important, and I kept sending myself to physical therapy to be sure I was doing as much exercise and uh, as optimally as I could. So primarily um, drugs. Primarily drugs. And the drugs are to uh, block the immune cell function. Now, To suppress the immune system. To suppress the immune cells so they can't attack you. And mind you, I was happy to take those drugs because I wanted to treat my disease aggressively, and so I was uh, very willing to do all of that. Uh, but now I, I also, with my functional medicine understanding and, and my own uh, clinical experience and my reading the science, we need our immune cells to repair and maintain our bodies. If I want to repair the myelin damage that's occurring, I need my immune cells to go in, mop up the damage, and supervise the repair. When you take uh, immune suppressants, you block the uh, repair that your brain's been attempting to do all of this time. So in traditional medical literature and the approach that doctors are taught, that we need to bring in these immune suppressing drugs because if it's the immune system that's attacking our body that's causing this degradation, we have to suppress that. But in that process, we also end up suppressing our general immune system, which is important for all sorts of functions inside the body. Correct. So we need our immune cells to maintain repair all of our function. Um, Without that, you have accelerated aging increased vulnerability to infection, increased vulnerability to cancers, which are, of course, increased when you're taking immune-suppressing drugs. You have a higher rate of infection and cancers, and you'll have uh, accelerated uh, aging. Uh, And no one is talking to you about general wellness. No one's talking to you about, okay. So it's it's a mix of genetics, unknown environmental factors. So what we ought to have you do is, let's have you do all of the known and, and there's thousands of studies that will tell us what are the diet and lifestyle factors associated with improved health outcomes. We could have just said, you know what, we don't know, so let's have you do all these diet and lifestyle factors that we can that are associated with improved health, which is basically what I was doing uh, once I started reading the basic science myself. It's like, okay, I gotta do everything I can. Uh, and so, you know, in the summer of 07, I'm like, okay, I'm really on the knife's edge of catastrophe here. I have to do everything. So I went back to meditation. I was convincing my uh, physical therapist to add e-stem to uh, get even more out of my exercise. I was reading the basic science and you know zeroing in on nutrition as well as I could. Then I had that big aha, like I shouldn't be relying just on supplements. I should be structuring my diet as maximally nutrient dense as I can using this template of nutrients as the most important ones that my brain needs. So you gave us the the typical thinking, and where did the understanding of functional medicine and your own research, like what dots did that connect for you? Like if you would bring in a new distinction that was there, that we're gonna, you know, you, you change your diet, you add in these supplements, you know, you're addressing some root systems. Correct. What were the dots that that connected for you? Well, um, so up until then, I was doing this sort of uh, PubMed article by PubMed article by PubMed article. But with functional medicine, I now had a framework to organize my thinking, uh, and so a much more comprehensive approach that validated, yes, make time to do your daily meditation. You need to uh, prioritize that. I um, it certainly reinforced the power of exercise, and then all the molecular pathways that exercise uh, was benefiting. Um, and then, Oh, as I was getting to the root cause and thinking back uh, that I needed to address 
mitochondrial function, because that's what I was really zeroed in on, uh, was I, I have to support those uh, mitochondria and detox pathways. I would eventually realize that the microbiome is really uh, a big thing that I was supporting with all of those uh, vegetables, all of that fiber, uh, and that increased uh, diversity, and then uh, uh, spending more time stressing uh, the fermented vegetables as well. So I, I would continue to refine things over the next year, but it, it was the framework, the more comprehensive look at what I was doing, and you know, steadily growing confidence that I am onto something. And then when I got onto my bike, I'm like, who knows how much recovery is possible? Clearly, the, the present understanding of multiple sclerosis is incorrect, is incomplete. The present understanding of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is incomplete. I, and that, um, I mean, I think like, well, yeah, maybe jogging will be possible. Uh, biking apparently is, again. I, and so the, the, the possibilities. And then, you know, in the meantime, in my traumatic brain injury clinic, you know, when I first got assigned to that clinic, the, the treatment was, well, we'll just give you psych drugs to control your rage, and we'll just see what happens. And then I come to clinic, well, like, to all these poor uh, men and ladies who were uh, uh, having immense suffering, I'm like, there's a lot we can do. I'm going to teach you how to eat, I'm going to talk about exercising, we're going to talk about meditation, and you're going to get your life uh, turned around. And we started turning people's lives around. At first, my colleagues were very, very unhappy with uh, my approach. And what do you think was the primary thing that came up for them, that you're breaking the mold and now other patients are asking them questions? Or, you know, I'm sure well, there's a, co a bunch of factors, but what were you noticing from them? Uh, well, the first thing, I, uh, I got called to the chief of staff's office. He said, you know, Terry, people, what are you doing? People are complaining. <laughs> Um, and so... Patients told, or other doctors? Other docs. No, patients were loving. Patients were thrilled. They, um, so I ended up having to um, go meet with the director for the complementary alternative medicine who taught me how to uh, talk about this more precisely in my clinical notes and in the public. So I was careful to not overstate my claims to say that I'm just improving cellular physiology, watching for a reduced need for medication uh, so we don't end up with you being over-medicated if your cells improve their function. Uh, so that I had to learn how to speak uh, carefully. They're teaching you how to be more politically correct. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but um, it, it is important to maintain those relationships with your colleagues. Of course, you're and a team. To, and to help patients understand that, no, I'm not curing them, but I'm let, letting them uh, treat their cells in a more effective way, and their cells are rebuilding them by correctly made molecule by correctly made molecule. And as that happens, their need for blood pressure meds goes down, their need for blood sugar meds goes down, their need for pain meds goes down, and everyone starts being less irritable. And they start getting along a whole lot better with their colleagues at work and their family. Similar to your situation, if I could interject, you never say that you're cured from MS. Oh, I'm never, you just say that oh, your not. symptoms have been reduced to such a big degree and your body function Correct. has returned. Now, oh, exactly. If I get exposed uh, to gluten, dairy, or eggs, my face pain will turn on. Or, you know, if I have too much stress, if I take too many flights uh, in a month, so my toxin load is too great, my face pain will turn on. So uh, I manage my disease. I always have those that genetic vulnerability, um, but as long as I do all of my self cares, I do very very well. Do you use the word recovery that you've recovered from MS? That you like? What's the word that you use to describe the transformation that you've had? So I, I've certainly have recovered um, a, a great deal of function. The question is, uh, am I a normal sixty four year old? My kids will say, "Mom, you'll never be normal," and I think that's true. But when I saw my neurologist uh, last week, he said, well, let's sort of take stock of where you're at. So what's the most rigorous athletic thing you can do? So, okay, how about I'll start doing push-ups for you? We'll see how, and so I did 10 push-ups for my toes. So, okay, well, that's pretty good. You can stop now. Uh, and I said, <laughs> okay, uh, how about vertical leaps? How many, so, so I did 10 vertical leaps. I said, okay, you can stop now. I said, okay, I'll stand on one foot. 
So after minutes, okay, we want you to stop now. I, I think we clearly have established that you're in excellent shape. I don't know what a normal 64-year-old American woman could do in terms of push-ups, but probably not 10, and I bet most of them can't do 10 vertical leaps, and they probably can't stand on one foot uh, for longer than a minute. Um, but I, I'm not as athletic as I, you know, I had hoped when I was uh, a young athlete, I was hoped to be running marathons, uh, be the white-haired grandmother uh, running marathons, passing the youngsters, so I, I'm not quite up to that yet, but I'm still hopeful. And you were starting to get into the microbiome. Yeah. And that's a big section inside the book. Yeah. Take us down the path. Yes. So this is really to put the power into people's hands fully and completely. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the diet frameworks revolve around the same kind of concepts. But it's so much deeper. Like you just said, the body is remarkably intelligent and so resilient. This is why we're able to still sustain the amount of damage that we do to ourselves through our diet and through our lifestyle. Now, how do we actually support and create optimal function of a human being? And this gets into really, when we talk about the microbiome, this is kind of like the final frontier where, we, where we're at now. And it's so fascinating because when I was in school, again, my typical university, college, nutritional science class, I was taught that the number one matriarch, patriarch, warden, emperor, everything, the, the tip of the spear is, is calories. Right. If we just manage these calories, we're going to be able to lose weight. Calories in versus calories out. All you got to do is expend more energy than you take in. End of story. And my, my college professor was right on the borderline of being obese. He was doing the thing that he was teaching but clearly it wasn't working. And this is the problem with our diet frameworks. Even if we get some results, many of us, and I know that I've done the same thing, something might work for a year, maybe two years, but all of a sudden something is off. And we blame ourselves that we're not doing the diet hard enough. I just need to keto harder. I just need to vegan harder. And not understanding that each and every one of these movements is going to be unique to us. We all have a unique metabolic fingerprint that has never existed before in, in human history, happening right now, and will never exist in the future. This is a unique thing. And the craziest thing is that even us right now, you and I, tomorrow, our metabolism is gonna be different than today. Not much, but it's gonna be different. The microbes, the cascade, everything, we're gonna be slightly different. And that's the beauty. But if we don't learn how to adapt as we go along, we're gonna to continue to disempower people. And they're gonna keep blaming themselves but it's just a, getting the right education. So when we're talking about that unique metabolic fingerprint, it starts with the microbiome. And this is highlighted in a study that determined that your, your microbes are determining what your body does with the calories you eat. My professor didn't tell me this, all right? He didn't know. We know now. And many folks who've been at the cutting edge of this space for a long time, they know that there were things controlling what calories do. And the calorie conversation was not the end all be all. So what they found was, this was highlighted in the journal Cell, they found that there's specific bacteria in mice that actually block their intestines from absorbing as many calories from their food, all right? Now, our allopathic approach would be like, we need to capsule up whatever bacteria that is, mm -hmm. give it out to people so their intestines stop absorbing as many calories. And this is, again, looking at everything from that very- Yes, from this very limited perspective, this tunnel vision. And also, of course, it's just like, for some folks, like, well, that's a mouse study. I know, I got you. In the human realm, uh, and this was conducted by researchers at the Wiseman Institute, and this was the same thing. In my clinical practice, I could have somebody to go and get a stool sample, and I can get their paperwork back and look at the diversity of their microbes, and without ever even seeing what they look like, I can know if they're obese based on their diversity of their microbes, all right? We know this very clearly now. And so what the researchers have kind of labeled this is, this is a very short, you know, uh, statement on is this quote, fat bacteria. There's a bacteria cascade that is directly associated with obesity and diabetes. We know this. Your gut reflects what's happening with your body composition. And what the researchers did was they took these quote, fat bacteria from obese test subjects and implanted those into healthy mice, lean mice. And they took samples from lean human subjects and implanted those into 
lean mice. The mice that were implanted with the fat, quote, fat bacteria from obese test subjects gained weight, gained body fat, and became insulin resistant. And the mice receiving the normal human samples did not. Changing the microbes changes your metabolism. And this is highlighted best. There was a study done on identical twins, all right? They're identical. You can't get a better like what happens with one or the other with this situation. And they took a look at their microbes, their cascade of uh, bacteria, the diversity of their gut bacteria. And they found if one of the identical twins had a bacteria cascade that was, again, associated with obesity, associated with insulin resistant, versus one who had a healthy bacteria cascade, they allowed them into the study. And although these identical twins are eating the same diet, same household, the one who had the cascade associated with diabetes and obesity gained weight while the other did not, eating the same diet, all right? This goes beyond the realm of just managing calories, all right? And this is what so many people have been fighting with their whole lives and just blaming themselves because even this getting put into popular culture as being what the issue is, this was largely thanks to a woman named Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. Right, All right. I love that section of the book <laughs> where you sort of break down the history. Let, let, let's talk about it. Let's talk about her, what she found and how she wrote this bestseller at the time that completely changed how we all see calories. Yeah, if, if you just ever wonder where did the calories come from or where did this, uh, where did our system being so focused on calories, where did that whole idea start? Well, you got to understand that when when calories were first discovered, it wasn't even for nutrition. They weren't looking for something to measure the energy in food. It was used in physics and engineering. And it wasn't until Wilbur Atwater really kind of made that transition over into the nutritional domain. And automatically the system was very flawed from the get-go because they would use a bomb calorimeter where they would take the food and put into a container, then put that container into another container filled with water, and they use electrical energy to incinerate that food. And whatever energy was used to heat that water up, that was how they measured the energy in the food. But this negates the, di the complexity of human digestion automatically because it's incinerating everything in that food. Whereas we don't even absorb everything in the food remotely. Like even if the term fiber, for example, that's going to create a net like gain on how many calories you're going to consume or uh, absorb or uh, a different net gain in the amount of uh, carbohydrates you're going to take in, right? So automatically it's flawed from the get-go. But Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters is who popularized it with her nutritional bestseller focused on calories, the key to calories. This was in the early part of the 1900s and she sold over 2 million copies of this book. So it was, I'm talking about everybody had this book. If you could read some, you got this book. And this was the beginning of the change. And I want to make this very clear here today. And I already ha highlighted it a little bit because I definitely want to talk about the brain. Food is one of the most powerful instruments in our universe for health and for happiness, but it's also a potential weapon for degradation and disease. The food that we eat creates everything about us. Our brains, our eyes, the folks that are listening, their ears, the tiny little bones that are vibrating and picking up sound and sending signals to the brain, every one of those steps is, is based on food. Every one of those systems, your heart is made from the food that you eat. Your brain is made from the food that you eat. Everything about you is made from food. The, the ink of the 3D printer that created us is food. <laughs> exactly. At its core, we are a conglomeration of the food that we've taken in or the lack thereof. All right. And so with that being the premise, food is such a powerful, dynamic, multifaceted entity, yet it was in that moment with Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters that it made the shift from food being this dynamic, multifaceted, powerful entity to being numbers. This was the shift to looking at food as numbers. And she said it, she said, you will no longer eat bread. You will no longer eat one slice of bread. You will eat 100 calories of bread. You will no longer eat a slice of pie. You'll eat 350 calories of pie. Food was numbers now. And she relented that a woman of her height could eat whatever she wanted as long as she maintained a dollar a diet, strict diet of 1,200 calories a day. That's it. And here's the side note that people don't get. She battled with her weight her entire life. Right, especially that time period that she was popular and her book came out, 
you look at history, you're starting to see in America specifically a large accumulation of weight amongst people where previously, you know, prior to like the 1850s, that wasn't a thing really, right? You didn't have people getting obese that way. Well, what came around that time period is our modern industrialization. So yeah. they thought, you know, she and largely a lot of other people that were in that same field, they thought that they had discovered something, mm -hmm. the answer to that question. But That's I cut it. you off, so please continue. Yeah, you just said it precisely. You know, we're trying to explain away the, the shift that had taken place from us having more of a, 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 a diet that was based on nature to a diet that's really based on agriculture, like hardcore. And not just agriculture at this point, but like heavily processed foods. They're really knocking on the door of becoming the norm. And so what I leaned into the story in the beginning was, this was also not just a shift to thinking of food in terms of numbers, but a shift to thinking and relating food to morality. This was the scariest part. When I went back and read her old writings, in this kind of old fangled book, I was shocked at how she was relating weight challenges as a character defect, mm. you know? And again, her having, being someone who struggled with her weight her entire life, she was battling internally. And she related food to words like punishment and sin. And also this was a major shift in our association with diet and weight loss because she associated diet success with you being hungry. If you're hungry, you're doing it right. And I've dealt with this so many times with patients coming in and working with clients over the years. And so she said, when you, when you, are hung, when you have hunger, when you have that hunger pang, you should have a double joy knowing that you're saving the hunger pangs of another person because there was like some food rationing going on around the world, time of World War I. And so she leveraged that, she used that psych psychologically to make folks thrive, uh, strive to be hungry. And now we know <laughs> hunger is a signal from your body that something is wrong. It's data, it's feedback. And I go through in Eat Smart and finally open up the entire conversation because many of our colleagues as well have really talked about our satiety and hunger hormones as being like leptin and ghrelin, right? It's just these two guys, but they're, they're kind of like the captains of the team. There's so many other players. You know, we've got CCK, we've got GLP-1, uh, we've got PPY. There's so many different hunger and satiety related uh, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that are going on that are regulating the system. And what we have to do to keep these things in balance is provide the nutrients necessary for them to work. And a big takeaway from today is that chronic nutrient deficiency leads to chronic overeating. Mm. All right, that's at the heart of it. A lot of our hunger is not, we can get into the conversation about how food manufacturers have hijacked this wiring but at the end of the day, it's really about us taking back control and giving our bodies the raw materials it needs for our hormones to work correctly. Mm. You know, when you were talking about, what was the machine that they were using to uh, measure out the calories? Bomb colorometer. Bomb colorometer. <laughs> that actually sounds like a positive thing, but it's funny. What a funny name. Right, you're the bomb you're colorometer. The bomb. <laughs> uh, it reminds me a lot of, how many of you ever seen this, but NASA has the largest vacuum in the world and they have it to basically test space shuttles. And uh, there's a YouTube video, we'll link to it in the show notes, but they basically talk about, okay, what happens when you drop a bowling ball and a feather at the same time in a vacuum? Well, you watch the video, bowling ball and a feather, you drop them same time in a vacuum, largest vacuum can fit a space shuttle. They both drop at the same rate. But here on earth, which is like here in our digestion, here in our body, where there's so many different mechanisms that are happening, things are pushing up against each other. You drop a bowling ball and a feather from a 747, they're not gonna drop at the same rate because right. there's friction, there's air, there's stuff that's interacting with it. And this is all just a larger part of, take us back to the beginning part of the conversation is that when you understand this, you stop looking at the world through these almost arcane ideas. Maybe they were well-intentioned back yeah. then, but we don't need Lulu Von Peters or whatever her name was. <laughs> <laughs> Lulu Von Peters. We don't I like need that her better. We don't need her whispering in our ear anymore, but you would think that she still is with how many people that still look at diet and eating through that lens. I'm just thinking about what she would whisper. She'd be like, you're hungry, aren't you? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> you're, you're doing it right. I don't think I'm a good whisperer. <laughs> so- 
you know, it, this is like you just said, I think that we, we, we tend to think we're so evolved in our thinking, but the reality is, and for all of us to just embrace this, we know next to nothing. We are so far from understanding how dynamic and amazing the human body is. We do know a lot more than we used to for sure. But again, our system is still trying to zoom in and, and find the, 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 the things, the small things that make things go wrong instead of looking at the overarching things that control what our genes are doing. And I talked to you about this before the show. I have a cognitive bias. I'm very aware of my cognitive bias. And I think it's a bit more mature, but I, because number one, I realized that we know next to nothing, which is a strong thing to say, but I do realize, and my cognitive bias is that if, if an, if an in, injunction comes in or if a, a recommendation comes in that it gets us away from normal human functioning, what we know to be normal, sunlight exposure, community, access to basic nutrients, you know, essential nutrients, uh, movement, you know, um, being able to be restricted and, and not be able to, to have movement, things that disrupt our sleep. If any of these things come up, and these are just a sampling, a red flag goes up for me and I immediately have hesitation. I'm like, whoa, I'm, but I'm still not negating the fact that maybe this new data is possible, but I have a strong cognitive bias. I do, I'm aware of that, that if it gets away from normal human functioning. And what I mean by that is there are specific things that our genes expect us to do, that we, we, we have a modicum of understanding. Our genes expect us to move. Our genes expect us to move. That's the environment that they grew up in. Exactly. So when we're not moving, when we become sedentary, these epigenetic programs, like so, and I just had this wonderful conversation with cell biologist, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, and also He's one of the people who really impressed upon culture. He might be the biggest voice in epigenetics and how above, right, epigenetics being above genetic control, how our environment controls what's happening with our genes. But more than that, our thoughts. This is the biggest thing. And of course, I do talk about this towards the end of Eat Smarter as well, and how our, our psychology affects what our DNA is doing, how our psychology affects what food does to us. And this was highlighted in a study in the book um, from Dr. Alia Crum and her team. And they had folks to consume a milkshake. They just made up a batch of milkshakes. And one of them, they put two different labels on them. One was labeled uh, Sensa Shake. Sensible is like, and they basically wrote on there, you know, it's like 120 calories sensible shake. Then they had another shake that was labeled indulgent, right? It's like 600 calories indulgent, you know? But the reality was they were both, it was right in the middle. It was like somewhere around 350 calories, you know, 380 calories. But based on the person's belief, when they saw the, the smoothies, the shakes labeled as being indulgent or sensible, it changed the chemistry in their bodies when they drank the shake. The folks who had the indulgent shake, thinking they're consuming more calories than they actually were, produced more leptin. They produced more of the satiety hormone and they had a greater reduction in ghrelin. Their bodies, uh, you know, are kind of the primary uh, hunger hormone. Their their satisfaction went up just based on their belief that it was more calories in the food, dramatically. And the folks who had the sense of shake, they their ghrelin levels barely budged. They were still hungry, but they had the same amount in reality. It's wild, and it really makes you think, especially with uh, a year like twenty twenty. With, with the pandemic and all the stuff that's been going around there, just your belief systems around even interacting with other people, especially for a lot of kids, you know, they kind of, even my niece, I was spending some time with her this past weekend and my family's very aware and they're understanding and they're trying to follow the regulations of the school and everything, but understands that, okay, there's a deeper conversation than what we're being told over here. Yes, you might want to be safe and smart about certain stuff, but no, we shouldn't be a afraid of people. But, you know, kids look around and they notice and they see how people right. are interacting, especially very young kids. And then having a negative association of like, can I hug somebody? Can I, you know, is that okay to be with them? Can I go up to this other person? It's amazing when you look into it, just how much our thoughts play a role into the makeup of how our body feels. Yeah, exactly. You know, because those responses, when you feel that hesitation, that nervousness around other humans, that's 
That's chemistry being created in your body. Every thought you have has correlating chemistry that's produced in your body. This is incredibly powerful. Your brain is the most powerful pharmacy in the known universe. And I say that because it's making the chemicals specifically designed for you. It's bioidentical for real. You know, this isn't just like you're taking some out external substance that your body, your liver has to try to figure out. Now, with that said, you know, this is something we talked about as well. We have to be mindful. And I don't feel that there were enough voices in the room making the decisions about how this has been handled clearly because of the very, very critical, especially in that elementary school age of the social and emotional development of the human brain. This is so important because some of this stuff can create permanent damage if children aren't able to develop that social and emotional skill. You know, like you need to be able to like take the kid's toy and like see what the response is and to like get that physical feedback. And my son, um, you know, fortunately we have, you know, his best friend lives next door, so they've had each other. Um, but they have a friend who they go, go to school with who hasn't seen another child in five months. And we both had that same thing, even when I shared the story, like, oh, that's gonna be, that's, that's gonna be a problem. And so many children, we're being inundated Unfortunately, there's a level, of course, there's a level of intelligence and safety, but then there's a level of extreme, which is where we're leaning towards, of children being led to believe and taking on the idea that they're not enough, that their body isn't enough, that they, they're not safe in this world. And we really need to talk about this. Like we really need to look at this because we can be creating an entire generation of humans who are afraid of other humans. And that was my concern at the or very- Or just even afraid of getting sick. Right, right. Right, just the fear of getting sick is gonna make you more likely to get sick. Exactly. And this isn't just like hearsay. We know this, that we've got data on this. And there's an entire bio bi biology of fear. You know, when you're having these stressful thoughts, when you're tuned into the news and you're seeing a death toll ticker, when humans have been relented to being numbers on a screen, no longer souls, you become conditioned to just, you start to see the world very differently. And bringing that into the world itself, it can start to create so many very strange like biases as we talked about before. And for me, I think, and this is kind of, it's a tough subject to talk about, but a big part of the reason I do what I do, even writing this book is my concern about our future generations, my concern about our children. And for this to be happening right now, I think it's actually wonderful. And I know it's kind of messed up to say, but I think it's because we had so many issues festering underneath the surface that we're not getting addressed. The child abuse, the, 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 the sexual abuse, the problems with our education system, the massive problems with the education system, our workforce. And I know you've done stuff on this as well and looking at the rates of unhappiness in our culture. And we're going into an education system that gets us ready to do a job that many people are unhappy about. And they spend their lives that's their lot in life. And we can do something better. At this point as humanity, we can reimagine these things. We can reimagine these systems. But this at its core is supposed to be a health issue. And yet we are the most unhealthy society in the history of humanity, self-inflicted. Right. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I heard a quote that you shared earlier and I, and I posted it today and it said, you know, especially when you look at the lens of, of the pandemic and what we went through, chronic disease which impacts so many different things. The inputs of chronic disease don't just create chronic disease. They can create chronic divisiveness, which we'll yeah. go into in a oh, second, yeah. which you said chronic disease loaded the gun and COVID pulled the trigger. Thought that was great. I don't yeah. know if you posted out as a quote, but I <laughs> yeah. definitely reshare that. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing that, you know, I shared data on this very early on when I saw the data coming out of Italy from their health minister. And he affirmed that 88% of the folks who lost their lives there had one or more pre-existing chronic diseases. About half of them had two or more. And for me, when, as soon as I saw the data, I was just, I, I, I was trying to do the, you know, the Paul Revere thing, like, hey, we've got a problem here in America. We're very susceptible. And then sure enough, um, ultimately the CDC published the report uh, just a couple months ago that 94% of the folks who lost their lives had an average of 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases, most notably being hypertension, type two diabetes and, hyper, and, uh, and obesity. And a lot of folks don't realize that when we're talking about these obesity numbers, obesity is associated with about 400,000 deaths every year, not just this year, every year. And it's not just like 
oh, this is a side note thing. This is a major issue. And the systems that encourage and support and even make money off of the sickness of our population are still running things. And we're still thinking we're deficient on a drug. Like we just need a drug to save us. We needed somebody to come through and provide this thing. We're inherently flawed. And these are the, the system itself is designed in such a way that if you're well, you're, you have no value to the system. You know, we need sick people. It's a farming of sick people. And so 94% of the folks in the United States who lost their lives, 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases. We can look at this from the, from the mindset of like, oh, they were going to die anyways. No, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Being exposed to an infectious disease when you are already susceptible, when your immune system is already compromised, radically increases your incidence of se severe and or untimely death, severe symptoms or untimely death. But the media focuses on the 6% who are healthy. And they just tell you the stories of the person who's perfectly, he's a college student, he's perfectly healthy, but they don't tell you about the 94%. Right. And even that person may not have a diagnosable chronic disease, right. but as we know, and as I talk about deeply in the world of functional and integrative medicine, you can still have major things going on with you and not have a diagnosis. And not just that, me and you, we can be as healthy as we want to be. We could have the best diet. We sleep well, all that stuff. We move well. But if we stray from those things that our genes expect us to do, if all of a sudden I'm sleep deprived, now I'm going on three days, I'm trying to work on this project, you know, I'm stressed out, I'm watching the news, whatever it is, even though on paper I'm healthy, right? I didn't have a diagnosis, I can compromise my immune system. As a matter of fact, um, the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology published a study and they found that just one night of sleep deprivation leads to suppression of your immune system, most notably, Suppression of your natural killer cells, which the FDA fast-tracked drugs that target our NK cells because our NK cells were so effective at killing SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. Right. So now you have an opening in the wall and something can come in, virus, pathogen, whatever, which normally your body would be able to block out. But we're all human, human beings. You can have a moment just like anybody else yeah. and you can become susceptible. This can happen to any of us at any time. This is why they're called opportunistic. This is why. And like we shared, we were talking about this before uh, the recording, we all carry around pathogenic, opportunistic viruses, bacteria, fungi, things that can literally kill us if we become compromised. A lot of times we think we quote, catch a bug, but many times it's actually something we already have in our system it's or on floating us. floating around. Yeah, that, that we're already exposed to, that's already in our system that gets on top of us because our immune system is compromised. Much in the same way that often now the understanding around things like the sh shingles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The understanding for like a lot of older adults can be at risk of shingles. Well, we know that the shingles virus has been inside of them before, but what causes it to be in a situation to be expressed? Yeah. Our immune system going down, maybe increased rates of inflammation inside the body, poor diet, lack of you know movement, all of a sudden something that was there the whole time now can have a chance to grow. And I know you also had, uh, we had him on and you had him on Jason Fung, who talks about the whole new view of cancer inside the body. And the latest understanding of cancer is that cancer isn't so much of a disease that happens to us, it's a survival mechanism when certain healthy cells get put in a specific environment. Uh, the most potent medicine other than food is love. <laughs> Tell me I, a little more. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, for years I was so focused on the minutiae biochemistry, physiology, genomics, metabolomics, and all the deep science around functional medicine. I was kind of a geek studying mitochondria and the microbiome and the immune system. So into it all. And, and I was really great at figuring out how to help people if they did what I told them to do. <laughs> and then I realized that, you know, it's really hard to get people to change behavior. Um, and that the most powerful way to do that is the power of love and community and connection. And I realized that after going to Haiti and working with Paul Farmer and saw how he cured TB and AIDS, not by better drugs or surgery, but by using the power of community, a power he called a company accompaniment. We accompany each other to health. And I did that 
philosophy with the Saddleback Church in Orange County in California, where 15,000 people got together in small groups to help each other live better lives. And we put a healthy living curriculum in the groups. And through the power of the group, and there was, remember, there was no doctor, there's no health coach, there's no nutritionist. It was just the doctor who put together the program that, that was implemented in the group. It was so effective. It worked better than any other healthcare provider's care in terms of reversing disease. They had a quarter million pounds of weight loss in the first year. And I began to sort of realize that, you know, I could learn all the biochemistry and genomics and physiology and, you know, every bacteria in your microbiome, but it wouldn't matter if we didn't have the power of connection and love and support, accompaniment, feedback, accountability. And that is really the other hidden ingredient in functional medicine, which is, you know, food is medicine, but also love is medicine. How do you integrate that into your life today? What does community look like to you on a personal level so that oh, you can God. get that love into your day to day? <laughs> I, I feel so blessed. You know, I've, I've spent my life uh, collecting and curating amazing human beings. Um, my only, my only uh, sadness is that there's so many that I, I don't really get to spend enough time with all the ones I want to spend time with. But I, but I do have a core group of people who become essentially my tribe. And some are closer, some are further away, uh, either physically or, or emotionally. But, but they're all part of this extended community of people who are looking to uh, grow themselves, to make the world a better place, to have fun along the way, to laugh, to help each other. And it's just such a sacred, beautiful thing. And I, I'm just so, so blessed. So I, I, um, I think I'm one of the lucky ones, but I, I also have been very intentional about it. I think, you know, we often don't focus on the power of love and community and friends. And we focus on our career, or our family, or the few things we, we have around us. But it really, it, it really is about the power of tribe and family and community um, as a key ingredient for health. And in fact, you know, the mo you know, when you look at longevity research, you know, you know, I'm going to biohack my way to longevity and live to 120 and use this supplement and this technique and this, this and that, the other thing turns out just belonging to a knitting group or a bowling club <laughs> is, is a better predictor of your life expectancy than even, you know, diet or smoking. So I think when we look at the power of community and connection and being part of that, it is probably one of the most essential ingredients for health. Now, there was a period of time where community wasn't something that you were good at or didn't necessarily like have. You've been honest with me in past podcasts that you've done where you really said like growing up, you kind of struggled with friendship. You didn't often fit <laughs> in and, um, and that you kind of thought of yourself as odd. And, yeah, I uh, did. <laughs> <I'm> odd. <laughs> and I want you to talk about that a little bit, but also... I think it's important for people who are listening here because last year, 2020, especially with shutdowns, lockdowns, pandemic, it was a very socially isolating year for a mm -hmm, lot of people. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that time period and some of the things that you did to actually find that tribe and be intentional about it. And I think that'd be really helpful for people who are struggling in that category. Yeah, well, there's a bunch of stuff you layered in there, but I <laughs> just start with, uh, you know, my struggles, I mean, obviously being a, a teenager is, is one of the most difficult things that humans go through, uh, mostly because other teenagers are mean and weird and not very friendly and nice for most of us. And I, you know, I was a little weird kid. I, you know, I was super into books. I was thinking about things like Buddhism and the environment and social change and was reading Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Thoreau and, you know, Asian religion. I was just like into weird shit. And... And I couldn't really relate to anybody who was in my community or my age, or it was, it was like, I was growing up in a seventies, 1970s suburban Toronto, uh, sort of spiritual vacuum. And so I was just, it was, it was a bad period. <laughs> and then I, you know, ended up meeting somebody on the top of a mountain in the Canadian Rockies, who's become my best friend, uh, my friend, David. And we, he was the first person that was like, Oh, Oh, you're, you're you. Oh, you're you. I, I recognize you. And there was a sense of uh, familiarity, family, recognition. And, and that was the beginning. And then I you know, went to college and found a community of people who were very similar to me and who were, you know, yearning, looking, seeking, wanting to know, wanting to play and discover. And through, through that, I, I actually joined a, a community group. There was a guy there who had written a book about community and he you know, gathered a bunch of college kids and other people and we just basically would meet regularly and we just hang out and we'd have fun we'd play games we'd eat we'd laugh we'd talk we'd share and it was just a really powerful 
powerful healing for me. Uh, and then, you know, as I've sort of built my life, I've continued to sort of build friends and community. And, you know, during COVID, it was it was challenging. So like everybody else, we were sequestered and you know, I made a real point of of gathering my my tribe. So like, there was there was another close friend of mine in town who was his daughter who was there and his, his wife had died and they were she was there with him. And so we, we formed a little micro bubble and we, we got together and we had dinners and we we really it was really special in the midst of all that isolation. Uh, and also I started to reach out to friends. So I have a, a like a bunch of guy friends. And, you know, we decided to create a sort of a men's circle where every week we would gather through on Zoom and you know, we're all in different parts of the world and we would meet. And we really had this beautiful drop in together and we've, we've done it every week and it was, you know, it keeps going. And it's, it's such a beautiful way to sort of use the technology, use the isolation, a way to help bring us together intentionally. And I encourage people to do that, you know, whether it's with family groups or friend groups, you know, it, it, it's not the same as all getting together for sure, but it's, it's pretty nourishing. I want to switch over to the topic of food being medicine. And I have a bridge question, which is that, you know, we were just hosting an ask me anything for some of your folks that follow your book and are going to help promote. And one of the questions inside of there was um, somebody who really struggles with emotional eating and emotional eating. Um, you have a friend, Mark David, who really talks a lot about emotional eating and the voids that people have. Sometimes when people have a really bad day, they would turn to emotional eating because really there's a void that's there. It's not the food that they want. They're just trying to fill in a void. So when Mark Hyman has a bad day or a tough day, what does he do to address that potential void? That's a great question. I mean, yes, if there was a pint of Chunky Monkey Ben and Jerry's in the freezer, I probably would eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to protect myself from myself by not having those things in the house. And I'm less likely to jump in the car and go sh shopping at, at night. But, you know, what I've learned is, <clears throat> and, and it's a very important skill that I don't, most of us don't know, is how do we change our state? Each of us has a physical, emotional state all the time. And sometimes it's joy, sometimes it's sadness, sometimes it's fatigue, sometimes it's Depression, I mean, we, we all live through different states all day long. And the question is, what techniques or tools can you adapt to or learn that will help you change your state almost instantly? So I, I've learned a few things. Um, one exercise is a great state changer. So whatever I feel, if I work out, if I go for a run, if I don't feel like it, if I feel like crap or I'm tired or I'm depressed, if I just go do something, I just feel better after. Uh, sometimes... Uh, I use hot and cold therapies, which is kind of a, a shock to the system. So a steam or a sauna, an ice dip, uh, and that really is a powerful state changer. Sometimes if I'm feeling really bad, uh, I meditate uh, and I'll just drop into a deep sense of quiet and peace or do a guided meditation or yoga nidra. Those things all can shift your state. And I think, or maybe sometimes it's just taking a nap if you're feeling bad. And I often, you know, I often ask myself, and I think this is what I encourage my patients to do as well, is to sort of when you're opening the fridge or you're opening the pantry, you know, ask yourself, what am I feeling and what do I need? Uh, am I hungry? Do I need food? Am I sad? Do I need to call a friend? Am I, you know, angry? Do I need to yell at somebody? Am I tired? Do I need to take a nap? Uh, I mean, what am I, what am I feeling and what do I need? And often we are mismatching our feelings with our needs. We think, oh, I'm tired. I need to eat. No, I'm tired. I need a nap, <laughs> you know, or maybe I'm lonely. I need a hug or I need to reach out to a friend. And I think if we can find better adaptive behaviors than uh, eating, uh, it's probably a good idea. And I, I think the state change concept, and, and it can be different for different people. You know, it, it just maybe it's calling a friend or maybe it's just taking a walk in the woods or maybe it's, you know, like I said, doing a cotton cold therapy or meditation or exercise, those all are, can be really powerful things to help change your state, which will change your mood, which will change your behavior. Let's talk about food. Is Dr. Hyman perfect with the food that he eats? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And I don't, I don't uh, pretend to be, I don't want people to be. I think, you know, what I, what I uh, think about is, is and, and, I, and often I get these questions, so Dr. Hyman, I, you know, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. You know, I, I think is how do we become resilient uh, in, in terms of food and our biology? Uh, and there's a concept in functional medicine called, you know, metabolic degrees of freedom. You know, you want to be free. You don't want to be restricted. 
Uh, and yes, some people have celiac and they can't eat gluten, or some people have lactose intolerance and they can't eat dairy. And there, there are certain real things. But what I've learned is that is that by choosing the right foods within each category of food, uh, and looking at quality as a benchmark, not just you know quantity or how much, um, then you can literally enjoy a wide range of foods and still do fine, right? So, so for example, I don't like to eat that much flour products because I think it's high glycemic, it's inflammatory, uh, and it's it's kind of a you know it's kind of a bad news story. However, I do love pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's a guy to do if he loves pancakes? Well, uh, thankfully, there's this new product uh, that's been developed. Uh, this, that's a resurgence of an ancient grain called Himalayan tartary buckwheat, which is super high in protein. It's got over 130 phytochemicals. It's powerful anti-inflammatory superfood. It, it's a really powerful microbiome supporter. Uh, and it's buckwheat flour, right? So it's a special kind of buckwheat. So I made buckwheat pancakes from this special flour and I had pancakes. So in fact, I had pancakes for dinner. <laughs> it was a friend of mine. <laughs> We're like, let's have pancakes for dinner. So I don't think I've ever had pancakes for dinner, but it was really, <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, I'm not perfect. And I, and I, but I will only eat real food. Like, will I have sugar? Yes. But it's sugar or honey or maple syrup. Will I eat artificial sweeteners? No. Will I have some things like monk fruit or stevia occasionally? Sure. But I don't, I don't seek those out, but I just choose real food. You know, if, and if so, if I'm eating any category of food, I choose the best within it. So for example, for dairy, um, I will choose sheep or goat because I do well with that because it has A2 casein because it's generally grown not in feedlots and it's grass fed. And so I, I typically will choose things within each category that are higher quality that, that still can be treats, but without the downside effects. But you'll never catch me eating Twizzlers or M&Ms or any of that stuff. Like I just, I, I don't want it. I'm not attracted to it. It's not because I have an ideology about it. It just doesn't look like food to me anymore. You know, it really doesn't. Like I'll walk by a Starbucks case of all these scones and muffins and this and that. And I'm like, I would eat it. I'm not, I'm not artificially restricting myself based on an idea. My body's like, just says no. Like, I'm like, I don't want that. That doesn't look like food to me. It's like, oh, is that a rock? Am I going to eat that? No, I'm not going to eat a rock. You know, so it feels like that. Let's break down one of those that you mentioned there, dairy, for example. Look through the food product of dairy through the functional medicine lens for you, right? How much dairy is too much and what kind of happens to you when you have it? And how much dairy is enough that you can enjoy and have it and occasionally, but it might not be something that you're eating, you know, three meals a day. So do we have an hour podcast for this one? <laughs> <laughs> I've done podcasts on this. In fact, I encourage you to listen to the one I did with Dr. David Ludwig. I think it's maybe coming out if it's out yet. And it was about an article he wrote with Walter Willett who these are both top nutrition scientists at Harvard, uh, called Milk and Health. And essentially, it blew up all the dogma about milk. Milk is good for your bones. Milk is important for your health. It's a good sports drink. It helps, you know, you lose weight. I mean, there's this whole mythology about milk. It's really propaganda designed by the food industry and the Dairy Council, along with our own government, by the way, uh, you know, like Got Milk. That was a government-sponsored program that promoted dairy, even though there was no evidence to support it. So uh, when I think about dairy, first of all, you know, we are the only species that consumes dairy after weaning. Um, that's not to say we can't consume dairy because we're omnivores and we can consume a wide variety of foods, but the dairy we're eating is not the dairy we ate. So if you're looking at historically, what did we eat? We had cows and sheeps and goats, which are foraging on all sorts of wild plants and grazing on grasses, not being fed, you know, corn and soy and feedlot, and grown in feedlots not pump full of hormones and antibiotics, not obvious, often milk while they're pregnant. And then on top of all that, we, we bred our cows in this country to have a high production of milk, to be uh, extremely efficient. However, we bred them to produce a certain type of milk, which has high levels of something called A1 casein. It's a type of protein in the dairy. And that particular protein is super inflammatory. It's super problematic for people in terms of digestive issues. It's been linked to cancer. It's been linked to all sorts of different issues with people. And I think that, that um, aside from the fact that milk isn't nature's perfect food unless you're a calf, it, it really has a lot of problems. However, if you find, for example, certain A2 casein cows, which are you know, maybe more high, uh, you know, heirloom cows, they might produce A2 milk. And sheep and goat produce A2 milk, which is less inflammatory, less digestive issues, better tolerated. And then if you even go further, you can find, you know, like 
like sheep or goat, for example, that are foraging on all sorts of wild plants that then uptake the phytochemicals. For example, goat milk that's, that's from goats that have been eating certain shrubs end up having these high levels of catechins, which are these phytochemicals found in green tea, like green tea is a super health food, right? I mean, the green tea is so great for us. Well, the same levels of these powerful phytochemicals that you find in green tea, the same levels are found in goat milk eating certain shrubs. So you can actually talk about quality, not all goat milk is the same or sheep milk is the same or, or, or cow dairy is the same. So I encourage people to, if they're gonna pick dairy, make sure you pick A2 casein, sheep or goat. If you're finding, you know, there are A2 cows and you can actually, I think, uh, Google A2milk.com and there are dairies that make it. I think certain Guernseys and uh, Jersey cows may have more A2 casein, a, a heirloom cows. So it's, it's available. Um, but I would also say that milk is not necessary for human health uh, and that it's not necessarily a superfood, uh, that, it, that it can be inflammatory for some people. And so I, I'm very careful about it. And as a functional medicine doctor, you know, I think, I have a lot of tricks in my bag, but getting people off gluten and dairy is often the most powerful healing strategy for people. So I encourage people to sort of experiment without it and then try it back and see how you feel. Yeah. And there's also this idea in functional medicine of like, eat like your grandparents ate or your great grandparents ate. And why I'm bringing that up is that a few years ago, I went to on a summit trip with our friends from summit, Elliot and all those guys. We went to Kenya. They invited me to go to Kenya. That was where I was originally born. I hadn't been there since I was first born. Wow. And we went to go visit a modern day hunter gatherer tribe. And it was called the, the, the Samburu. They're basically oh. cousins of the Maasai. And the Samburu pretty much do not eat during the day. They chew on some twigs, a little bit of berries, but they drink four glasses of milk and they've been living this way now for about 800 to a thousand years. It's not exactly clear. And when I got there, I was just so fascinated by this is pretty much all they live on is milk. Occasionally when they don't have milk, they have this practice where they do a little bit of bloodletting for the cow and, you know, drink the, the blood. And then sometimes on birthdays and holidays and special occasions, weddings, they might have a, a goat or in some rare cases they might slaughter a cow. But I guess in, in that instance, I was so surprised to find that there was actually a modern day hunter gatherer tribe that could. But in that instance, when you look at it, they're living on a completely different version of dairy than we're used to. And also they've been doing that for quite a bit of time. Right. So in that yeah. instance, when, when you look at that example, how do you think about that? Well, you know, it's a great example. And also, you know, you look at the Inuit, they lived on 70% of their diet as fat. So we have a capacity to eat a lot of different foods and survive. And, and I think when you look at, um, you know, what they do in these cultures and the Maasai and the, and, and maybe this other tribe is, is they don't just have the milk. They'll put in like a dozen different spices or in the meat, they might put in two dozen different spices. And what we've learned is that when you combine spices with animal food, it dramatically changes its effect on your biology. It, instead of potentially causing inflammation, it can reduce inflammation. And, and this is why, for example, in Morocco, they use tons of spices with their meat. They eat a lot of meat, but they don't have the same rates of cancer or other harmful effects that we tend to associate with meat eating. So I think it's, it's a complex story. Uh, and I think if you're looking at what probably the cows they're, they're raising in, in, in Kenya, they're probably not these Holstein hybridized cows that have all been fertilized by one bull from like North Dakota, <laughs> you know, basically <laughs> are, are so monotonous and, um, and bred for volume and yield and not necessarily for nutritional quality. And so when these cows they're eating are, are foraging on wild plants and they're eating all these phytochemical rich foods, their milk is rich in phytochemicals. Their milk is more nutrient dense. Uh, and if they add the spices, they're getting all sorts of other benefits. So I think, you know, we, it, it speaks to the fact that it's, it's not, uh, uh, this Russ Conzer said it very well. He said, it's not the cow, it's the how, right? So it's how is the cow raised? How is it prepared? All the, all those questions. How, how is the soil that, that it derived its food from? Is it depleted or is it enriched? You know, so I think we, we have a lot to learn. Um, and I think if you were to sort of do a breakdown on the biology of the milk that, that they're consuming, it's probably different than you get when you go buy, you know, some milk in the grocery store. <laughs> Like the process of homeostasis isn't all removing all inflammation, for example, because we do need inflammation in small amounts to signal to our body about uh, stresses or to fight pathogenic bacterial microbes or to signal to different molecules about how we need to grow. 
um, or you know, boosting immunity, for example. It's not all about ramping up our immunity. It's about balancing our immunity because we need our immune system to, yes, recognize mutagenic uh, cells, to clear them away, um, but we also need like a balanced immunity because otherwise we lead to things like autoimmune disease and we don't have a, a regulated immune system um, that becomes overactive and it actually leads to damage to the body. So I, I love the parallels, it's like all about contrast and this, this concept of dynamic um, uh, movement and homeostasis and actually the yin and yang. I mean, these are sort of parallels with ancient medicine that we've known for years. It's sort of something that I've come to realize is, is paramount to the, the, the true functioning of the human body. Even at this conference where they're talking about stress and addiction, especially when it comes to stress, what are the good stresses? What are the stresses that we can take on yeah. and embrace in our life and actually push our body to sort of give our body that nudge that it wouldn't normally seek out on its own. And there's a lot of research on that. And that actually leads into the next area, exercise as being one of those categories. So how help us understand how exercise can be part of that good stress that can help our body and our mitochondria renew and many other benefits uh, for the brain. Absolutely. So exercise is something I use quite a bit as an analogy as to why inflammation might be a good thing in small amounts or it's a it's an adaptive response. So when we exercise in the short term it's a pro-inflammatory uh, outcome. So we're, we're increasing shear factors to our muscles, we're increasing circulating levels of inflammatory markers. We are putting our, our body under stress essentially. But overall, that leads to an, an adaptive response and it leads to uh, a resilience that leads to overall benefits to the human body. So when you exercise, you're increasing mitochondrial biogenesis, you're increasing infl circulating inflammation, you're causing shearing to your muscles. And by the process of repair, it leads to things like hypertrophy. It leads to things like removal of uh, malfunctioning cells. It leads to a better cardiovascular system at a macro level. There are so many benefits of exercise that in the short term, if you looked at it over the first like 30 minutes after exercise, you'd be like, this is a really bad thing. We shouldn't be doing this. You look over the long term, it's like, oh, actually, no, this actually leads to resilience, it leads to benefits. It's a, a, like, um, it's something like uh, uh, the hormetic effect of, of plant chemicals. So turmeric, everyone thinks of turmeric as like an anti-inflammatory herb, right? It's, a, it's on all the supermarkets, everyone's talking about turmeric being anti-inflammatory. When you look at it, it's a, it's a plant hormetic compound. So Can you just explain hormesis for those that are listening? To yeah, yeah. So hormesis is essentially the uh, dose response of a particular plant compound leading to uh, inflammation in the short term, but overall benefit over the long term. So it actually leads to an ab adaptive response. So in the case of turmeric, when you introduce it, it elicits a pro-inflammatory uh, reaction. But overall, that encourages the body to reduce the inflammation overall. So overall, it has an anti-inflammatory benefit. So that's why we look at turmeric like it's an anti-inflammatory. Actually, it's a plant hormetic. Um, and some peppers up often operate in the same uh, capacity. Yeah, yeah. So pepperin, pepperine, it improves the uh, bioavailability of turmeric, and and actually. Turmeric isn't on its own. Resveratrol has been argued as a plant hormetic compound. Um, a lot of the different sort of polyphenols that we have in our diet, they're plant hormetic compounds, because when we're in, uh, ingesting them, what they are, the, these different polyphenols, they're essentially the um, stress compounds that plants release to protect themselves against microbes, against defenses and that kind of stuff, which is why organic produce May, be, uh, may have greater amounts of phytochemicals and greater amounts of um, micronutrients because they are under a lot more stress. So they don't have the, uh, the benefits of having um, a weed killer uh, to, to- Or produce. DNA that's modified that or way. Or DNA that's modified, exactly. So when you're introducing these compounds into your body, they're eliciting a mild stress-like effect, but that leads to overall benefits to the body, which is the same sort of analogy I like to, to use with exercise as well. So it's quite interesting when you when you look into the subject a lot in a lot more detail, which is something I've been doing during my master's. I'm still studying. I wouldn't regard myself as an expert in any way. And I don't think even after studying this for 14 years, which I imagined to do, I would ever be an expert because there's just so much to learn. And my understanding of how things are in the human body has evolved so much over the last year, let alone the last 10 years. Um, but I find these parallels with ancient medicine and modern medicine and, and nutritional science, absolutely fascinating because we just learn so much. And it just, it always comes down to the same principles. Eat fiber, largely plants, 
quality fats, eating in time, and eating whole, i.e. reducing the amount of refined sugars. And when you apply those concepts to any meal, any cuisine, you can make anything healthy. And that's the same thing. It's kind of like, um, uh, have you heard of um, Samin Nusra? She, she wrote the book, uh, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Yeah. Um, it's a Netflix program. Uh, I love the way she uses those this four elements of food to describe how you can make any meal delicious. If you get the right level of salt, fat, acid, heat, you can make any dish delicious. I like to think if you get the right level of whole food, uh, quality fats, fiber, um, plant-focused, uh, and eating in time, you can make any meal healthy. Uh, and it's sort of that recipe for, for looking after your brain, but also your heart and, and everything else. So we veered off of exercise. <laughs> no, not at all. It's perfect. When your uh, book came out and, you know, talking about these uh, elements of ancient nutrition, uh, the latest science, you know, all these examples, did your mom text you afterwards and just say, like, <laughs> I told you so? <laughs> She's constantly telling me, I told, told, I told you, so. you so. Yeah, tons. And like, I was giving a conference to um, uh, some health practitioners, some functional medicine practitioners, and uh, some nutritional therapists. And they were all arguing, you know, but your, com your conventional medical community doesn't appreciate or doesn't accept Ayurveda, or it doesn't accept Chinese medicine. I'm like, look, you can call it whatever you want. Call it lifestyle medicine, call it functional medicine, call it nutrition. It doesn't matter. As long as the patient is getting the right information, as long as the patient is being encouraged to live a way that's conducive to a healthy body and a healthy mind, that's all that matters. The infighting between, you know, Ayurvedic medicine practitioners and naturopaths and all the rest of it, I think it kind of detracts from actually the main goal, which is helping our patients live healthy, happy lives using food and lifestyle medicine. So yeah, when my mom says, I told you so, I just, I, I love that. I think it's great because she does. She, yeah, and she the whole reason you. why I got into this is because of her, so. Yeah, especially uh, cooking. She taught you how to cook. Yeah. And we talked about that in the first podcast. Yeah, before That's I went to medical school, yeah. <laughs> um, speaking about reactions to the book, uh, any stories of fellow doctors or practitioners that are at the hospital um, or I guess you call it s surgery. Yeah, yeah. That have uh, picked up your book and and uh, had insights or, or transformations or stories. Anything that you can share with us? Yeah, uh, feedback yeah. that you've gotten. I've had some pretty amazing feedback from a ton of people, a ton of followers, a ton of uh, nurses in particular that have picked up the book and given it to their partners and stuff. And it's just it's encouraged people to look at food in a completely different way. <clears throat> I think the, the gravitas of having a doctor talking about uh, food and nutrition is, is super important. Ironically, given that we don't get taught nutrition uh, and the fact that people are taking more attention to it, it's, it's quite funny. But, you know, I like to, to, to give people the understanding that I, I'm giving an educated, unbiased view of nutrition medicine. And I think by having a doctor talk about it and encouraging people using delicious, uh, culturally diverse meals to look after your health, it's a very attractive proposition. So the people that I've heard of have like improved things like psoriasis, improved brain fog and mental clarity. People have improved yes weight, but also just how they're feeling themselves or improving the way people look at food and actually uh, get more ingredients in the diet. The simple concepts of variety, fiber, color, all these different things. I just love seeing that. And I, I hope to continue on this mission, man, because I know that can help a lot of people. I've seen it anecdotally in my own clinic, but we also see it spread out across all the different research studies that I've used going into this book. And that's why, you know, I can talk about skin health, immune health, and inflammation health, and, and talk about it into in great depth, but still bringing people out of that and actually looking, you know what, it's all the same, guys. It's just getting those healthy principles, and lifestyle principles to look after every aspect of our well-being. They say that one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. And I'm sure in writing this book, there was research that you were there. We're like, okay, I kind of knew about that, but like, yeah. whoa, is there one section uh, or area or, or disorder or condition that you were writing about and it just like blew your mind? Yeah. What yeah. was available to it? Can you uh, Absolutely. pick one and share a little bit more about it? Yeah, definitely. It was a mitochondrial signaling actually uh, in the immune section. So in the immune health section, I, I talk about um, A, what the function of our immune system is for. It's there, yes, to protect us against pathogenic material, uh, um, uh, bacteria and microbes and our skin as part of our immune system, etc. But it's also there to be the internal sort of um, monitoring system, our, our internal. Everyone likes to think of our immune system as our aggressive military force, you know, fighting off uh, uh, infection, defending us against ill health. 
but actually it's also uh, got a peacekeeper role in our, in our body. So it's, it's going around, it's looking for um, uh, mutant cells, it's clearing away them, it's actually recognizing friend from foe, that's why a lot of our immune system, around 70% of our lymph cells and uh, immune cells are located around the gut. Um, and it's performing very much a peacekeeper role as well. As, and one of the most important things to, to think about is the impact of mitochondrial function supporting our mitochondria um, through things, removing westernized foods, removing inflammatory foods, and improving things like uh, in, intracellular antioxidants and improving plant fibers and all the rest of that, um, as having a signaling role involved in immune health as well. And to, to cut a, a short, but long-winded biology story short, Improving mitochondrial support is essential for improving our immune function. And I like to say improving immune function rather than boosting immunity, because I think it's, uh, it's, it's more true to the, the actual function of our immune system, to say we're supporting our immune system rather than boosting it. Because if we just let it do what it needs to do, it often operates just really well. Yeah. So, so in a lot of the chapters, you talk about foods that, that will support it and improve the function or allow it to happen naturally. But then naturally there's the contrast of things that, that can kind of take away from it or damage it. What are some of the most common things that affect how our immune system operates and can have an, have an impact on that? Absolutely. So what, one of the things that we're taught in functional medicine, start with the gut, right? So the gut is probably essential to every single chapter in the book. I could have talked about the gut in every single chapter. And in fact, fiber comes up as one of the recommendations for food that we should be having all the time and different types of fiber as well. So when you look about, uh, look at the, the gut functioning, specifically through the lens of immunity, you realize A, it's got a huge role in terms of, of um, recognizing friend from foe. Um, when we introduce different sorts of plant fibers, what are they doing? Well, they're giving fermentable fibers to our microbes. And what do they do? They create things like short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, the top three are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And they're used to nourish the colonocytes, so the different sorts of cells that you find in your colon. They're also there to provide energy to them. They're also there to provide an anti-inflammatory role. They have a, a role in signaling uh, as well. Um, they have a vital role in immune function. There's two kind of schools of thinking. One, one school of thinking is like, okay, well, we need to give exogenous sort of short-chain fatty acids in them different ways. And whilst, yes, there are therapeutic benefits of doing that in isolated cases, the mainstay of treatment is just trying to get as many different types of fibers. And that's why a rainbow diet, eating the colors, having lots of different types of plant fibers, is absolutely essential to supporting our immune system. And that's why I think I talk about that in, in every section. Here in America, I don't know if it's the same case in the UK, but we've seen a, a, an uptick in colon cancers. Yeah. And one of the theories, of course, there's a lot of things that play into to that uh, increased alcohol consumption, all, all sorts of different components that could play into it. But one of the theories is this, the, the reduction in diversity and the reliance on more processed foods or pre-prepared foods. Last year in the US was the first year that people spent more on eating out than they did on groceries yeah. as a total. And so now we're relying on finished Foods from places, prepackaged items, we're not getting that same level of diversity um, often inside of our diet, and that has all sorts of implications. Absolutely. We just there's a paper that came out, I think, just last week about ultra processed foods and how that encourages people to a overeat because they don't have the same satiety signals. So the um, uh, the, the the production of leptin, which uh, actually uh, reduces the satiety signals, uh, sorry, reduces the amount that we feel hungry, um, is not affected to the same degree as normal whole foods. So that leads to overeating. We're also, with ultra processed foods, obviously we're removing a lot of the fiber because it's already pre-digested or there's a lot of fiber removed. So that again reduces the roughage that we have to push through um, uh, different sorts of materials in the colon. We know that if you are constipated, you have a greater <clears throat> likelihood, sorry, <clears throat> when you have uh, less fiber, you have a greater exposure to envir environmental pollutants that are naturally removed from the colon when you push, uh, push them out. Um, and the exposure to environmental pollutants will lead to more reabsorption of them as well through the system. And that's why you have uh, um, potentially a greater propensity to, to colon cancers and different sorts of cancers. Um, but it's the same issue that we're seeing in the UK as well. You know, we have rising rates of, of colon cancer. We have uh, way too much uh, convenience food in our, in our um, food industry, in our, in our food sort of market. Um, and people just aren't eating enough whole foods as well and, and evaluating the amount of fibers that we have.
There's also the, the, the school of thinking around um, immune health as well. So we know that um, certain types of um, fillers um, and additives to food will increase the translocation of pathogenic bacteria through um, parts of the colon called M cells. So M cells are responsible for um, uh, looking at sort of friend from foe. Uh, and we know, and there is a clear uh, association, potentially causative association with fillers like polysorbate 80 um, and other food additives that may be increasing the amount of uh, pathogenic material that gets in through the gut wall and then causes that inflammatory reaction, includes that Im immune uh, reaction that leads to uh, um, poor, um, uh, leads to uh, damage to the, the colon, which leads to colitis. And examples of foods that could contain those fillers? Uh, I would say convenience foods, where you have a ton of ingredients in the back, you would just look through them. Um, things that I find, uh, you, you'll find probably in um, uh, takeaways, um, deep fried fatty foods. I don't want to name any convenience stores here, but you, you probably know the big ones uh, that are globally everywhere. Um, there is a rising rate of IBDs, inflammatory bowel disease, that includes ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. Um, whether that's related to uh, increased processed meats, whether it's increased uh, additives to food, it's quite hard to say, but there's definitely a correlation there. And I think the more whole foods you have in the diet, the better that's going to be for colitis. And we know actually that increasing fibers, particularly from fruit actually, um, can reduce the flares of uh, colitis that you see. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's tons of research done. And I think it all comes back to the same thing. Eat more whole foods and eat more fiber. Which I think is important also for people who think that they eat very healthy is because it's, if you still rely on a lot of packaged healthy foods, yeah and not whole foods, there's still, as the health movement grows and continues to become massive, multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry worldwide and more companies are being bought and more of the big players like Pepsi and Nestle and other things are getting into their own quote unquote healthy foods. There are still a lot of these additives or other components that still have a detrimental impact on our health. Absolutely. I know for me, the one thing that I got super clear on, I was, always, you know, for the last 12 years, um, I, I went on a gluten-free diet almost 20 years ago in the year 2000. Wow. <laughs> I went on a gluten-free and I, I, I removed dairy and gluten out of my diet and I didn't even know what gluten was at the time. I did it primarily because I was at a talk uh, with the lady who was talking more about from an animal rights perspective, but she shared a study showing how dairy, for some people, especially uh, uh, black African-American people, South Asian and Asian populations, a lot of people are naturally act lactose intolerant, but even if you're not lactose intolerant, uh, a lot of commercial dairy is very, can be pro-inflammatory. Yeah. So if you have skin issues, which I did at the time, I had really bad acne in high school and I had tried a lot of different things and I went on different gel, Accutane, all the different yeah, stuff that's yeah, out there wow. and uh, nothing really worked. And I got off of dairy, processed sugar, and then later on gluten. And especially because of the dairy, my skin cleared up within a matter of months. Yeah. And I saw a completely, and people would ask me like, what did you do and yeah, what, did you, yeah. what happened? I'm like, why did I not know about this in high school yeah. <laughs> when I had my first girl, you know, girlfriend and I was taking my prom photos. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna see those prom photos. I know, I know, I gotta find the photos. Yeah. Uh, well, I got kicked out of my prom, that's a different story. <laughs> so I don't even think I got photos. <laughs> that's great. But uh, so one thing I found out for myself, so I've been, in the, I've been playing with my diet for a while I've been having uh, attention on my diet, but one thing that I really noticed in the last uh, five years is that I would still rely on some of these healthy packaged foods that would have things like canola oil inside of there. And I realized that when I cut out canola oil, and especially for me, fried, fried foods, even if they're like healthy sweet potato fries, yeah. I stopped getting sick. Yeah. Now that's for me. Yeah. My sort of Achilles heel was always my tonsils and my throat and that sort of thing. And I can always tell when I travel, and I eat these foods, even if they're healthy packaged yeah. foods, healthy quote unquote, those all have an impact on my immune system and I just feel tired, more lethargic. And it really does come back to this idea of really getting back to whole foods. Totally, man. I, so funny you say that, right? So I was uh, asked to be a judge for um, some healthy food awards, healthy quote unquote, uh, for a big magazine uh, in the UK, it's a big health magazine. 
Um, and we were taken into uh, their offices and they laid out all the different foods. We had different categories, alternative milks, energy bars, uh, snacks, like nut butter, all this stuff, right? So we had um, ton, like probably 10 different types of foods in every category. Bar the nut butter category, which is pretty much 100% nuts, just ground. Um, but some of them still had added like palm oil and, and you know, all, loads of other crap, salt and, and sugar. Um, uh, and maybe uh, another sort of category, I think it was uh, alternative milks, because some of those were fortified um, with things like iodine, which is an important source that we lack from a lot of different food components in our, in our normal diet. Man, everything was crap. Everything was crap. It had additives in, it had fillers in, it had sugar via different names. Um, it had uh, the amounts of sugars with different sort of natural sugars, quote unquote. You know, it has the same impact on lipoge de novo lipogenesis in the liver, so which is the process by which the liver creates its own sort of triglycerides and pumps them out to the, the rest of the body. Um, it, it, it was pretty staggering actually, because I, I don't personally eat these products, but I know a lot of people who are trying to be health conscious, just like you were, um, will be eating those, feeling safe in the knowledge that they're doing the right thing. Or it's being sold at Whole Foods or these other places. Whole Foods and you know, even John Mackey himself, before he retired uh, as CEO of Whole Foods, said, we sell a whole bunch of junk. And he was right. You know, he, his, his legacy, unfortunately, will be, you know, yes, Whole Foods is giving people the option, but unfortunately, you still have to be pretty educated to navigate the food aisles of probably, arguably, the, the healthiest supermarket in the US and the UK now as well. Um, so yeah, that there's, there's tons of that. And to go about dairy, this is something I, I talk about in the, in the skin section. There are, there's two ways of looking at it, right? So I have tons of anecdotes from patients who have removed gluten and dairy and improved the acne. And the same thing, I have people who have removed everything from the diet and not had any impact whatsoever. There's a whole bunch of other things going on. But looking at the evidence base, right, what can we say, particularly looking at the perspective of acne, what can we say about um, elimination diets and acne? Well, first of all, I, I like to think about the body as to what we can put into the body to try and improve its function. You look at the skin function, for example, it's incredible. It, in the matrices, the fact that it has an immune function, the fact that we have photoprotectants in food, so things like um, uh, the, the different sorts of vitamin A, uh, the zeaxanthin, lutein, all these different things, they actually have the ability to physically reflect light. In addition to sun creams, we should be looking at diet, right? When we look at the function, uh, when we look at the dysfunction we see with acne, what we do know from the literature is that high refined uh, sugars, so high glycemic diets, may be impacting acne. Potentially, the mechanism by which is uh, through insulinotropic effects. So we increase insulin, that dis, uh, causes hormone dis uh, dysregulation and leads to acne. Worse in females than to men. You might have uh, had the same issue with that as well. So removing that, the, the high refined sugars, uh, high refined carbohydrates in your diet may have had impacts on that. So milk may be acting by the same mechanism. So when you introduce milk, particularly from skim milk, when you introduce milk into the diet, it has the insulinotropic effect pro-inflammatory potentially as well. And it might be impacting hormonal dysregulation, which causes acne in a lot of cases. So that's why we see a large proportion of people um, having benefits of removing dairy. There lies the question, okay, if you're removing dairy, what are the potential nutritional complications of that? The big thing, and a lot of people think about calcium, right? Calcium milk and whatever. You get calcium from a whole bunch of different sources. Sesame seeds are a great source. Tofu is a great source from green quality. Green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, beans, fantastic. Iodine is a very important source. And uh, with, there are not a, a many sources of iodine in the diet. So when you're removing things like dairy, which is the commonest source, one of the commonest sources of iodine in the diet. Because they're being fortified? Uh, no, no, because no. It, it naturally occurring naturally iodine. Has iodine, yeah, naturally iodine. So you're going to be thinking, okay, where am I going to get my iodine from? Um, and fish, uh, quality, quality uh, fish, great source of iodine. If you're vegan, you may want to supplement with iodine. But beyond that, you know, fortified milks are actually pretty good. There's some really good alternative milks that have fortification with iodine in it. And it's a very important thing, particularly for childbearing women, because it impacts 
thyroid function, but it also impacts the the, uh, the health of the baby in utero as well. And we're seeing some negative effects uh, with people cutting out dairy actually and not having enough iodine and having some uh, pregnancy complications. So um, yeah, I think it definitely has benefits uh, for certain people. We need to like sort of balance the nutritional potential nutritional complications of, of removing certain foods. I think there's definitely a healthy way to do all these things. Um, yeah. And I welcome more research into it because, you know, as your experience is, it has benefits, man. You know, I, I actually don't have that much dairy in my diet and my, um, uh, not my skin, but certainly my, my nasal passages, ENT issues that I used to have. I had my tonsils out as a kid. I used to have recurrent tonsillitis. All that kind of stuff has improved as well. It might be my, my general immune function though as well. It might be my, my gut bacteria. It might be a whole bunch of other things. So there's so much to learn in the subject. It's exciting. Hey YouTube, if you liked this mashup all on inflammation, you're gonna love this interview with Dr. Terry Walls that talks more about inflammation and autoimmune conditions. The leading neuroscientists are saying, we have to preserve your brain. Even if you take disease-modifying drugs, you're at high risk of developing early cognitive decline, at high risk of having accelerated brain